Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Denzel, and I host Unfound, and I run this YouTube channel. I realize you don't want to give a thumbs up to the following video until you watch it. You know what? That's totally understandable. I can appreciate that. But what you can do right now is subscribe to this channel. The button is right there. Thanks. Jay Boyle, Michael Cummins, Daniel Higgins, Jamie LaFebert, Robbie Rumbolt, and Chad Smith were six teenagers from Pickering, Ontario, Canada. In the early morning hours of March 18th, 1995, the group was at a party. They then were headed to a marina to goof around. Video caught three of them there minutes later. All of them were never seen again. I'm Ed Dunsell, and this is Unfound. There are all sorts of facts and coincidences and statements and disappearances that catch our attention more than other parts. And because they catch our attention, we automatically think, yes, this is the key to this disappearance. This is the reason it hasn't been solved yet. If this part could be resolved, then everything would come together. Some examples from Unfound's history. The two security guards from that hotel who won't talk about Cameron Remmer. Why did some of Andy Chapman's associates end up with his car? The allegations Shelva Rafty made against her boyfriend right before she went missing. Really, who would not like to know as much about these topics as possible? The problem, in Unfound's history, we also have examples of items that we thought were so important that ended up being nothing. Esther Westenbarger's no-good, long-criminal history brother. The half-hour-long call Zoe Campos made to a friend of her mother's. All the rumors that Noah Davis was alive well after his disappearance date. Well, with the disappearances of the Pickering Six, there's a whole bunch of stuff that will catch your attention. But does any of it mean anything? Are these things truly red flags? And now a summary of the case. This is not on my friend Megan Linus' website, charlieproject.org, due to the missing people being from Canada and them also disappearing there. Jay, Michael, Danny, Jamie, Robbie, and Chad were all about the same age, but that didn't mean they were the same. Danny was the youngest of the group and the one who tried to stay out of trouble. In contrast, some of the others had already had problems with the law, and in fact a couple of them had taken a water tricycle that wasn't theirs out on Lake Ontario the night before, essentially stealing it, but bringing it back. Jay at 17 was already a father. Yet all of them had experience drinking underage, and some of them had experience doing drugs. So on March 17th, 1995, all of them ended up at a huge house party in Pickering. For reasons that are still unclear, Jay and Danny got into a fight that ended up being resolved through a mutual female friend. When the boys left after midnight into March 18th, some of them stated they were headed to the marina to goof around. And in fact, Jay called his girlfriend, telling her that's where they would be. Minutes later, surveillance cameras caught only three of them, 
Michael, Jamie, and Robbie walking into that marina. The other three are never seen at that location. All six were never seen again. An investigation discovered that a boat owned by the marina was missing, with the assumption being that the boys stole it and an accident happened on Lake Ontario. Yet, like the boys, the boat has never been found despite extensive searches done at the time and since. The disappearances of six people all at one time in a location where the perception is that they should be found quickly but aren't shocks us, especially in an age where searchers and investigators have access to helicopters, water current maps, and sonar. Everything seems so straightforward, but it ends up being the opposite. I would like you to contemplate that conundrum as you try to answer these three questions during the interview. Number one, would Danny really go out on a boat with Jay after they had just had a fight? Number two, why are not all six boys seen on video at the marina? And number three, what are we to make of a gas can and a pair of red jeans with bones inside found far away from Pickering? Are they connected to this case? The families of the boys in general believe foul play occurred due to neither the boys nor the boat being found. The guest for this episode is an investigator for the boys' families, Bruce Ricketts. Unfound news. First and foremost, I thank all of you for the birthday wishes. The messages, the emails, the cards, the gifts, all of it completely overwhelmed me. Thank you. Next, those of you who are on the email list should have received your newsletter in your inbox this past Monday, August 1st. If you're not yet on the list, please contact me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. Finally, the next episode of Unfound Now will be released on the Unfound YouTube channel this weekend. I analyze the recent disappearance of Dana Smithers where you can find Unfound on these following podcast platforms, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and many others, especially outside the United States. Social media sites, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the newest one, TikTok. Listener support sites, Patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast, PayPal.me forward slash unfound podcast. The website, the unfound podcast.com. The email address, unfound podcast at gmail.com. And please mention unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound, Bruce Ricketts, and he is an independent investigator for the families of the group I am calling the Pickering Six. Bruce, welcome to Unfound. Uh, thanks very much for having me. You're very welcome. And uh, everybody should know that uh, this is a, a, a group of disappearances that was suggested to me by a listener maybe a month or maybe six weeks ago. And I said, yeah, I, I, let's, let's, uh, I'd love to cover this for the episode. And I uh, reached out to Bruce and he got right back to me. And that is how he ended up on this episode. So I'm very happy to have you, Bruce. Let's talk first about you. You've devoted uh, my understanding of the last 12 years of your life, starting in 2010, to these, this group of disappearances, these six young men. But let's get to know the man first. Tell the people a little bit about Bruce Ricketts. Oh, um, well, I'm a good-looking uh, older older gentleman uh, with. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, no, I'm a I'm a, um, a retired uh, 
um, serial entrepreneur. Um, I've I've started many companies and and shut the, sold them off and everything else over the, wow. over the years. I've traveled most most of the world doing doing that. My background actually started in, in medical sciences, um, where I was in charge of a blood bank uh, at one of the major hospitals up here in Ottawa, Canada. Huh. Um, and then from there, I got into uh, believe it or not, agricultural sales, and uh, then into the high tech business and and everything else and and. Uh, I'm a, uh, a father of three, grandfather of four, um, have no pets, thank God, <laughs> no pets, um, but, uh, and, and um, this is what I do for, for, for um, my hobby, if you want to call it that, it's more than a hobby, but uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it was an interesting uh, thing getting this far, I mean, I'm, I'm a private investigator by, by, uh, by vocation. Um, but, and also an author, uh, I've written books on things like shipwrecks and Neat. I've written some political, political books, uh, some that got me in trouble because I said too much and uh-huh. some that uh, people are still scratching their head going, how, how did he know that? Um, mm-hmm. but, um, about, uh, t- about 12 years ago, I guess it was, um, uh, I was contacted by a friend of mine. I had a, a website at that point in time that was called Mysteries of Canada. Um, the website still exists, but I, I'd sold it off about uh, about seven, eight years ago from now. But uh, I had this website called Mysteries of Canada. It was uh, Canadian history, geography, myth, and legend. Um, mm. I called it Mysteries of Canada because if I'd called it History of Canada, seven people would have looked at it. <laughs> As it was, calling it Mysteries of Canada... Uh, at the time that I sold it, there was over 10,000 people per day wow. from all around the world accessing that site. Mm-hmm. It's also being used for, for uh, teaching children uh, about Canadian history and, and uh, uh, First Nations and Indigenous uh, uh, history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but a, a friend of mine contacted me and said, you know, here's a mystery for you. And he, he told me a little bit of the story about this, about these uh, six missing boys. Mm-hmm. Um, I hadn't heard about it at that point in time. Um, I'm up in Ottawa. This is in Pickering, which is uh, most of the way to Toronto from here. So it's about three, three and a half hour drive. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I did some research on it and I wrote a small story about it on Mysteries of Canada. Didn't, didn't really know very much, but it, it intrigued me. So I started doing my own individual research on it. Um, I reached out to one of the families um, and um, it took me almost a year to connect with that family. Uh, hmm. And uh, it, one, of the, one of the reasons is that they, they, they didn't know who I was, obviously, um, but uh, they were concerned that maybe I was just looking for some publicity or something like that. Yeah. But, yeah. but over the last 12 years, uh, you know, I've met with uh, five of the six families. Um, mm-hmm. The sixth one I cannot find. Uh, they, they completely disappeared from... From uh, from Pickering, uh, no one seems to know where they've gone. Oh. I've got a I've got, I've got a very long list of of uh, rumbolts across Canada. That one of these days I'm going to sit down and go through all those telephone numbers and see if I can find a, a connection to them. Yeah. Um, but at this point in time, five or six is not too bad. Yeah, that's so, that's uh, I would say yes, that's mm-hmm. pretty good. Uh, there was something you said there that um, kind of caught my ear. So going back to 1995 when these disappearances happened. You just don't have any recollection of it, you know. I'm sure it was covered, you know, locally in, in Toronto or wherever, but it didn't make its way up to Ottawa. Of course, you were in business at that time. You said traveling the world. Do you think that's the reason you missed it, or do you think that maybe it really just didn't get out of that immediate area? What do you think? I, I don't. I don't think it got out of the immediate area. If you weren't reading the, the New York, uh, sorry, the uh, the Toronto uh, uh, newspapers or the Pickering newspapers. Uh, uh, it was probably on CBC, but I can't even find a history a file of that on Canadian Broadcasting System, uh, uh, oh. Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, I should say. Um, wow. So I, I didn't know anything about it at, at the time. Now, the guy who told, who told me about it was actually from Pickering. So okay. uh, he, he was connected to it in that way. So Okay. All right. Uh, does that uh, maybe surprise you? Given, uh, of course, you've been working on this for 12 years, but does it surprise you that it didn't make it out of that immediate area? Do you think that's like kind of standard procedure 
for media in Canada or, you know, how do you look at it now? Uh, d difficult to say. I mean, 1995 was, a, was an interesting period in Canada. Um, there was, there was a lot going on. Um, I, I, the other thing is that uh, it, it appeared to have been a, a local story. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't uh, there wasn't a big hue and cry about it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, so when I when I went looking for for documentation for it, there was not a whole lot of documentation to find. Um, from from my perspective, anyway. Now, one of the families, uh, the the Boyle family, keeps a scrapbook which is about that thick. Yeah. Um, of all the stuff that was yeah. being said down down in that area. Yeah. Um, there was also a, a video done on Vision TV uh, that was done by by an independent uh, filmmaker. Um, that was uh, Vision TV is one of those um, touchy feely types of uh, networks, okay. and they did they did a uh, they did a video that uh, I've, I've been given a copy of from back in 1995. Uh, basically what the families were going through at that point in time. Yeah. And that was a great help to, to my understanding of, of what was going on there. But uh, now what I found in the last 12 years does not in any way compare to the information that was, that was available back in 1995. Right. Uh, we, found so much inf so we found yeah. so much information Um it, it leads you in different directions, uh, which like any, any investigation really does. Um, and the, the, the trouble is now trying to figure out which of the dead ends, which, which ones, uh, you know, don't need to be followed, um, which ones have solutions at, at their end and, and we can go back on it. And that's what we're doing right now. We're, we're finding those mm -hmm. types of things. I should ask you this, uh, given that you had not heard about this until this guy from Pickering told you about it, but you st had started this website, Mystery of Mysteries of Canada. Uh, what other maybe mysteries had you looked into or reported on, you know, before this one kind of maybe uh, took over uh, your life for the last 12 years? What are some of those other things maybe that you had worked on doing that website or written about or looked into? What are some of the other things? Well, there was there was a lot of different things. I mean, the, the, one of the very first uh, things I ever looked at was was a uh, a shipwreck off the coast of Newfoundland in 1919. Uh, my wife and I were were, were up in the, on the west coast of Newfoundland. That's 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 the island yeah, right at the, at the at the far end the far end of Canada on the east yeah, east coast. For sure. Um, we we were we were up that way, and uh, I saw a sign on the side of the road that said. Uh, that said, uh, the wreck of the SS Effie. No idea what it was. You know, let's go down and take a look. There was a couple of uh, uh, poster boards down that area, but down on the shore, there was this wreckage of, of what was a ship. Out in the water, there was there was a uh, there was a, a boiler and uh, and uh, a manifold. We're still out in the water. There was an awful lot of other stuff on on shore, including decking and uh, bits of metal and everything else. So uh, I took note of it. We went north to 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 Lanson Meadows, which is the site of the uh, the uh, uh, initial uh, Viking landing in North America back in 1000 AD. Um, they landed uh, in in uh, in this area called Lanson Meadows in northern north uh, western uh, Newfoundland. And we went up there and I, I took a look at that and I was really interested in that, wrote about that for the website and everything else. And on the way back down to, uh, to uh, leave Newfoundland, mm -hmm. we stopped at a place called the Shallow Bay Motel. Um, and the Shallow Bay Motel had a, had a, um, had a, um, uh, a theater attached to it, live theater. So they had dinner theater that night. And the, the subject of the dinner theater was, the wreck of the SS Effie, which was the shipwreck that I just finished seeing a huh. um, couple couple of days before, mm -hmm. so we went to that, and uh, it was an interesting an interesting uh, uh, play, uh, well done, you know, for for local local theater. Um, but the interesting part about it was at the very end of the play, the play was a was a conversation between a reporter named Cassie Brown and the the first mate on the SS Effie, the ship, and they were talking, 
And the, long story short, the the ship got caught in a uh, um, a real bad squall on at in in December of 1919. Um, they forced it to come ashore. Um, the boat landed on 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 shore, um, broke the back of it because there's, there's no beaches there. Well, the beaches are there, but the beaches are big rocks. Okay. <laughs> so they and the the, the 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 local fisherman who uh, was there with his wife and uh, six kids, I think it was five kids, um, ended up uh, connecting a bosun's chair, so a rope chair, basically, from the from the ship to the shore, and they took all ninety two people off the ship and saved oh, everyone. Wow, including including a baby that was taken off in a mailbag. So. This was this is kind of an interesting story. Yeah. But at the very at the very end of the play, um, the reporter asked the first mate a question, and the question was, "What about the dog?" And the the first mate said, "You know, what do you mean?" And they said, "Well, she said, uh, Cassie Brown said, uh, what about the dog that that was what saved the people on the, on the ship?" And the response was. Um, there was no dog. We were the dogs. Okay. And that's how it ended. Huh. And boy, if you want a mystery of Canada, there's a good one for you. What the hell are they talking about? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, so I, wrote, I, I wrote about this thing up on, on my website. And uh, uh, about uh, six, seven months later, I received a message from a lady who had a caller um, and medals that had been awarded to a hero dog of the SS Ethi. Hmm. It was a uh, it was a, a rather large uh, leather um, collar with a silver chain on it and, and and silver writing and and there was a little plaque that said hero and then there was a medal hanging off it and, and it talked about the SS Ethi and on the reverse side of the medal. It was the number ninety-two, so obviously there was something there. Yeah. The interesting thing was this happened on the west coast of Newfoundland. This lady was calling me from Wrangell Island, Alaska. So, <laughs> it, opposite side of Canada, not even in the same country. Not even the same country. So my wife and I uh, decided, well, we're, we're going to go up to Wrangell Island, Alaska, and see what's going on up there. So we flew uh, flew from we were in Calgary at the time. I uh, flew from Calgary to Seattle, Seattle to Ketchikan, Ketchikan to Wrangell, and then spent a week up there. Uh, located uh, the the grave of the guy who who, who brought the collar and, and a dog with him. And I traced that from there back to a place called Chipman, New Brunswick, and then to, to Fredericton, New Brunswick, and then back to Newfoundland again, and uh, ended up writing a book about it. Wow. Um, so that, that's the kind of detail that I get into. Yeah. I, I, lo I love doing the detailed stuff. And, and uh, so the listeners should know that you're a very detailed guy. So when we're going to be talking about these young men who went missing, this is the kind of person who has been looking into their disappearances uh, for six years. Here's a guy who traced a, a collar the whole way from Alaska, the whole way back to Newfoundland. Right. <laughs> so, okay, great. Well, that sounds uh, pretty uh, precise, pretty intricate work to me. Okay, great. So we're getting a good idea about the kind of investigator that Bruce Ricketts is, and that sounds like that that is um, very, very detailed. Thank you for that story. Now, before we get into this, uh, you know, before we start talking about the Pickering Six in detail, I want to be, I want to make sure the listeners and viewers are able to maybe follow along. Because we're going to be talking about maybe some currents, some pictures, and things. Why don't you just give out the name of your website and the Facebook page right now, so if people are listening, they can maybe look at some of these things we're going to be talking about as we go. Why don't you give that? And we usually sure. do this at the end. We will do this at the end. But why don't you do this uh, right now, so maybe if people want to kind of follow along as we go as we go along. Sure. sure. The, the the Facebook page is uh, um, Facebook. Uh, Lost Boys ninety five is the is the uh, I, I don't know what they call that. I guess it's the name of the page or something like okay. that. Okay. Um, 
and there's a link from from there to to the website and the website is uh, is lostboysofpickering.com okay um, that's it's a brand new website so uh, mm-hmm. and, and i am not a very good uh, uh, website designer so Me it, neither. it looks a little it looks a little rough but uh, and uh, and it's it's now growing quite, quite a bit uh, mm-hmm. but the hope is that, uh, that the website uh, lostboysofpickering.com becomes more of the, the resource for most people. Facebook is a great way to, to get the information out, but the problem is it's, it's all disjointed. Right. Um, and people ask questions and they've already been answered a couple dozen times. And so that's why I, I decided to, to go, with, go with the website in addition okay. to the Facebook page. Why don't you so, give the, uh, the website name out one more time uh, before we get into these details. One more time. Sure. Lost Boys of Pickering, that's P-I-C-K-E-R-I-N-G. Dot com, lostboysofpickering.com. Very good. Let's start here when we uh, discuss this disappearance. Now, there's no way we're going to be able to get into all six young men and their backgrounds and everything else. I think uh, for a lot of different reasons, maybe number one, maybe people just get confused. But what do the listeners need to know? You've been working on this 12 years. What do you think the listeners and viewers need to know about these young men? Um, maybe they're, you know, how they knew each other. Did they work together? Did they go to school together? What would you say just in general about these six young men uh, from, from the Pickering area? I, I can talk about five of the, five of the six of them in, as a group. Um, uh, believe it or not, in the, in the last two months, I've learned that there was an, actually an outlier to, to the group. Okay. Uh, but uh, the f- five of the six uh, uh, are Jay Boyle. Uh, Michael Cummings. Uh, Jay and Michael are 17 years old. Uh, Jamie Lefebvre uh, was 17. Now, he didn't come from Pickering. He came from a place called Scarborough, which is kind of the next next town over, part of, part of Toronto. Uh, Robbie Rumble, who was 17, and Chad Smith, who was 18. So yeah. that's, that's five of the six. They, they were connected by uh, being friends uh, of some standing. Um, I guess they parted together. Um, they got into trouble together. Okay. Um, four, four of the five, excluding uh, Jamie Lefebvre, went to, went to the same school. Um, okay. And uh, two, two of the boys um, had actually dropped out of school, out of high school at the time, wow. um, which comes into play a little bit further down, down the pipe in our, okay. our discussion. All right. Um, the outlier of the whole thing was Danny Higgins. Mm-hmm. Uh, Danny Higgins was the youngest of the bunch. She was 16 years old at the time. Um, he did, didn't appear to be, have too many connections to, to the other five. Um, and in fact, uh, Jay Boyle, who was kind of the, the, the focus of my investigation at the time, and still, still remains kind of the, my focus on, on the investigation. Mm-hmm. Um, Jay, Jay, Jay Boyle and and Danny Higgins didn't even know each other before the, the night that uh, that all of this happened. Um, huh. And in fact, uh, uh, there, there was an altercation uh, between uh, Jay and Danny at at the party that they were at on the seventeenth of of, uh, of March, nineteen ninety five. Um, and uh, Danny left the Danny left the, the party and somehow, by the sounds of it, connected back up with the with the guys a little bit later. Um, I, I need to ask you. That, maybe I need to ask you. So, when you call Danny Higgins the outlier, is it because of his age, or because he didn't go to the same school as those guys, or maybe he? Let's just. This is just an example. Was he a little more clean cut than the rest of them? What? Why do you call him necessarily the outlier? I, I my understanding is he was he was a bit more clean cut than the other guys. Number one. Okay. Number two, he he wasn't part of their of the group. Okay. Okay. So, in other words, they the gang if you want to call him that um so um okay and he, he went to the same schools uh in that same area and everything else but uh so i say he was a bit of an outlier to the to the to the other five okay at the time now is it's it, interesting is that, it well, <laughs> if if i may i'm sorry yeah, if i may so they all end up at this party did they all but did they all six go together or did danny show up there by himself and the other five kind of or did they actually all go to the party together no they they ended up at the party separate from, separate. from each other oh, yeah okay so they were all, all at the party type of thing okay 
All right. So, Thank you. All right. So the you say Danny Higgins is the outlier. You have these other five guys who seem to know each other a lot better. They're closer in age. Uh, maybe they have a little rougher background than Danny does. Um, what uh, led them to this party then on that night of March 17th, coincidentally, St. Patrick's Day of 1995? Well, that, that's actually the reason for the party was St. Patrick's Day. It was. Okay. Yeah. So there was, there was drinking going on. Uh, there's evidence that there was, there was drugs involved mm. um, at, at the party. Um, I have one, uh, one uh, report, not, not, a, a, not a police report, but an individual report that I, I've collected over the, over the last number of years, mm. that there was, in fact, LSD involved in, in, oh my. at the time. And and that's that wasn't an unusual drug at that point in time either. Um, understand also that uh, that there was a drug trade between uh, the Ontario and New York State. Uh, okay. It went both directions, by the way, uh, but it, but primarily it came from Canada to 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 uh, to, to New York State, and and okay. primarily primarily over the water. Um, mm -hmm. In 1995, uh, there wasn't. Uh, you know, there wasn't that that much of a border patrol going on. Um, we used to go to uh, to uh, Clayton, New York, a lot by boat. And what you did was, you, when you got to Clayton, New York, you'd simply uh, find a telephone and you call the the customs people, and um, and you just let them know that you're there. Mm -hmm. You give them the number of your boat, you give them the number of your passport, and everything was fine. Um, if you didn't do it. Uh, they probably wouldn't know you were there. Mm -hmm. So uh, the border was fairly lax back in 1995. Um, and as I say, there was a, there was a pretty brisk uh, drug trade going on back and forth between, between uh, New York and, uh, and Ontario, primarily from the Pick Pickering area and, and uh, you know. Uh, right across Lake there. Ontario. Getting yeah, right across Lake Ontario. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who was holding this uh, party that night? What was the connection between these young men and whoever hosted this party? I, I think this was at a house or something. This wasn't like at a bar or a club or something. No. This is somebody's house uh, who you don't have to necessarily name the person, but how were these people? Did they all just like know each well, other? It was, it was uh, Chad Smith and his girlfriend that, that lived oh. in, in this particular house. Okay. Um, so, and, and, uh, well, Valerie is the girlfriend's name. She mm -hmm. she becomes an important part of the, the next part of the conversation. Okay. Um, um, so uh, it was their house, uh, and the party started there. It went on for a period of time, and ultimately the party then either broke up or moved on. We're not really sure which. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, that that was the yeah. You know, it was a it was a good time party type of thing. Okay. Do we know, you've already mentioned this fight, and it was between Jay and Danny, who you said didn't even know each other hardly at all before this night. Do we know what this fight was about? Does anybody come forward to tell you what this fight was about? Who Jay's girlfriend it? How was bad a, was it? Well, it wasn't, wasn't bad. Uh, basically, Jay just took a swing at, at Danny and, and uh, I guess, knocked him down or something like that, and, uh, and then Danny left. So, I mean, it, it wasn't a big altercation. Mm -hmm. um but uh my my the report that i had from from jay's girlfriend who by the way wasn't at the party uh they had a four-month-old baby <laughs> at mm -hmm. the time uh jay and, and, and his girlfriend had a four-month-old baby so she wasn't at the party but uh one of the things she said that she thinks that it was probably uh probably uh you know alpha male type of stuff mm -hmm. uh, okay and uh you know jay was feeling his oats and uh, end up taking a slug at, uh, at at somebody. So and we have to remember there was drinking going on. There was drugs there too. So of course that could have, of course factored into that uh, as well. How big? Yeah, I, would, uh, I, would, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know anything about that. Of course, no, no, I wouldn't either. But we'd have to guess. <laughs> um, how, being that we have, we know six guys were there. We, I mean, this must have been like a pretty big party then. Yeah, I don't know the, the the actual number of people that were there, but I, I would imagine it was there was quite a few. Um, so, but I, but I don't know absolute numbers. Okay, 
So it's March 17th. It's a St. Patrick's Day uh, party. And this kind of spills over into March 18th. And, of course, the party's maybe uh, eventually breaking up. And what do at least one of these guys say? Something about going to the marina. What have you been able to learn about the exact wording of that? Who did they tell? My understanding is that uh, the, the, the terminology was used when we're going to go down to the marina and goof around. Um, that, that, was the, that was the terminology that was used. Um, it's, it's not clear at this point in time how the, the party broke up or how, how the, the five of the six boys left the party. Did they leave all at the same time? Did they go in the same direction? We're not sure. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see on the website, uh, when we get, get to discussing that, uh, there was a video uh, that was taken at the marina uh, right. that the boys went to. And the, and the, the video only shows three of the boys uh, right. connected. Um, so three, three of the six. We know that uh, we know that uh, uh, Danny had gone earlier. Uh, now these are the three, and then there was two left, and it was Jay Boyle and uh, and uh, one of the other boys. I had a report from from uh, a local resident that told me that uh, there was an awful lot of yelling and, and breaking of bottles going on at a, at a small um, uh, shopping center not that far away from where the party was. And okay. it sounded like, like one or two boys that were, that were feeling their oats up there at the time. So it's, it's, it appears that, that the groups broke up. Mm -hmm. um, and the evidence of, uh, at the marina is only of three boys at marina right and we'll get into um, the video we'll get into the video a yeah. little bit later i think the most important thing leader the listeners and viewers need to know at this point though is so the the distance from where the party was to and we're going to be actually there are two marinas involved we just want to make that clear but possibly uh how far is it from where the party was happening to the marina walking distance right walking distance. i'd say probably a little less than half a mile oh very close very close, Sam. Yeah. Very yeah. close. Okay, so even shorter than a kilometer. Yes, I do know my metric system. Okay. <laughs> good, All good right, you. so less than a kilometer, less than a half mile. Uh, what's a kilometer? Like 0. 0.63 or 62 of a mile, something like that. Something, something like that, yeah. Yeah. All right, so less than a half mile, very, very close, could be walked very, very quickly. And so we have this statement. Yeah, we're going to go down to the marina, whether that meant three of them or five of them, six of them, two of them. Not quite sure, but we're going to get into this video uh, a little bit later. Now, we're going to skip ahead, so because we're, so we're going to kind of look back on things. But when is the first point at which maybe one of these girlfriends or somebody's parents or somebody starts thinking, you know what, uh, I don't know where my boyfriend is. I don't know where my son is. When, what is the first warning sign, the first red flag that goes up for anybody connected to these six young men? that says, you know what, something's not right. When does that happen and who is it? Um, it happens with, uh, with uh, the girlfriend of Jay Boyle and the girlfriend of Chad Smith. So okay. Monique, uh, Monique and, and Valerie, um, the two girlfriends involved. Um, I gather that, you know, they woke up the next day and there was no one around. So uh, um, they connected up uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my, my understanding is that um, that Valerie went down to the marina um, and made a telephone call back to to uh, to to Monique, and uh, they ended up getting together because Valerie was concerned and she wanted to know if if if, uh, if not only had, had Jay come home but also had uh, had uh, Monique seen uh, uh, Chad. Right. And the answer, of course, was zero, not. So huh. that's when they went to the police uh, to, to, to make a report. Now, okay. um, Monique can't remember exactly what time it was, but, it, but it, was, it, was, it was early morning. So I suspect it was probably about six or seven o'clock in the morning. Um, that's not corroborated, by the way, by the police report. <laughs> we can get into that one a little bit later yeah, we too. Will. And we the, will. Police report, the police report said it was 3.30 in the morning. And uh, 
and there was just no no possibility that it was, that that was correct. But, okay. uh, All right. So to put this in, in a nutshell, for this part of it, the girls think it might have been like nine a.m., ten a.m. of March eighteenth, but the police report for some reason says three thirty a.m. Correct. Okay. All right. Now, thing thing to remember here is that. Uh, Monique had received a telephone call from Jay from a payphone at 1.30 in the morning. Um, he said at that point in time that he was going to, he and a couple of other guys were going to gonna go down and steal a, uh, or take a joyride on the, the water tricycle. No mention, by the way, of a boat at that time. Okay. But they were going to they were gonna get out on this water tricycle. It's the same one that they, they'd ridden the night before. All right, we'll get into um, that for sure. We'll yeah, talk about that later. So this is the second time. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Very good. So please so, continue. Hang on. So so Monique, uh, when receiving the telephone call, um, basically says, you know, that's that's crazy. You know, it's March, it's it's one thirty in the morning, you know, in this and uh, uh, at that point in time, Jay said, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the guys back to to the apartment. Is that okay? And she said yes, and that was the last time she made that she she talked to him, but that that one. 130 telephone call was was crucial because from the police perspective that's when the 24 hour uh, hold off period begins mm -hmm. so th they won't accept a, a missing persons report unless the person is missing for 24 hours so so 130 in the morning uh, uh monique hears from from jay yeah at, at nine o'clock or, or their whereabouts uh she goes to the police and the police say, well, it's not 24 hours yet. So, uh, you know, we're, we can't do anything about it. Uh, matter of fact, in, in the report, he's, the guy says that uh, I don't think they're in danger at all. Uh, and, and there's nothing I could do for, for, the, for the girls and everything else. So get, the, get the parents to give, give us a call. And then they didn't do anything until after they had a call from the parents. Um, okay. So it took, it took almost 36 hours. From the from the time of the disappearance, before the police actually started doing anything about looking for these kids. Okay, uh, how do you, uh, your understanding? Once again, you stated that uh, ultimately you've spoken to five of the six families, uh, you know, involved in this disappearance. What have they said? Of course, we know about these two girlfriends. What have these other families said about how they learned that their missing young men were missing? You know. How did it come about for them? Well, it was it was the call from the police to, to okay. say that uh, you know okay. they they had to send and they they called the they called the they called uh, the, I guess the police informed the 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 families, but I think quite frankly the 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 grapevine within the families is probably the probably the way the information okay. got out. So the girlfriends called called their friends and right. called their friends who called their friends. Right. And that's I'm sure that's the way the information got out. The police will tell you probably different, but uh, okay. You know. So maybe we could see what this is just be an example. So the these two girls who obviously were very young too, maybe 16, 17 years old, just like these guys were, they go to the police, the police blow them off. And so what they do in the meantime is they might call the the families or friends of these other guys who they knew were with jay and right. Chad. and so that's how this kind of like you said like that old 80s commercial you tell two friends and you tell two friends and so on and so on so right. i got gotcha. you okay very good so everybody eventually seemingly fairly quickly uh starts to find out that well he's missing and he's missing and chad's missing and jay's missing and danny's missing all you know eventually all adds up it seems Fairly, quick, fairly quickly. So once this 24 hour period uh, is over, what did the police do, um, you know, those next few days? So we're now March 18th, 19th, 20th. What is your understanding about when they finally felt like doing something, what happened? They, they, uh, the police uh, launched a, a, a search. They, uh, they called in uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force who provided a Hercules aircraft, a C-130 aircraft, as well as a, a helicopter, a air, sea, air sea rescue helicopter. Um, they also called in the Toronto uh, Police Department's Marine Unit uh, to, to lend a hand. They also had um, the equivalent to, we, we don't have a Coast Guard like you have a Coast Guard, 
Okay. Uh, but 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 they called in those people. Um, and obviously there was a lot of people on shore. There was fishermen and everything else, and they all went looking, see what they could find, and uh, they found nothing. Absolutely, one hundred percent zilch. All right, and this um, was all on the strength of this call that Jay made, saying, "Yeah, we're going to go down." Of course, they made a comment at the party, "We're going to go down to the marina, mess around." Then we have this one thirty a.m. phone call. Yeah, we're going to the the marina, and we're going to try to take that tricycle out again. It, all on the strength of that. And also on the strength of uh, finding out that there was a boat missing from yeah. the East Shore Marina, and yeah, that was the that was the Boston Whaler, the imitation Boston Whaler that uh, that uh, the police surmised they they all crowded into that that, that boat, uh, fourteen foot boat with six six big teenagers on it, um, you know a little bit tough. Um, well, let's the, get let's police... get into that. How how was the boat discovered? to be missing so once again just kind of put this in the time lane they say they're going to the marina no reason to not believe that and so on the strength of that they're thinking well maybe they went out into the water but in the process how was this boat found to be missing and what name the marina if you could it's east shore marina and the uh it was a service boat so it was being used by the uh by the uh the people at the marina to do things like dredging and and collecting oh. trash and stuff like that so um uh, i guess i got there and and uh, um found that there in the corner was the boat gone as huh. they say <laughs> so the marina so, so uh, this was uh so i guess what we do want to differentiate this was not a customer's boat somebody was paying to have a slip no. there this was actually a boat owned by the marina that might be used to do whatever work needs to be done around a marina, maybe tow a boat or something like that, maybe. Correct, yes. Okay. Did any of these uh, young men have any experience at the marina? Did any of them ever work there? Did any of their families have a boat there? How familiar, your understanding, what, were they with the marina just in general? Um, my understanding is that the two, two of the boys uh, were pretty avid sailors. So they, they had an awful lot of a, a few skills with respect to to being on the boat. Um, okay. I've not I I can't remember exactly who, what what those two boys were who who the okay. two boys were, but uh, but there was two two of the six in a way that, uh, okay. that uh, knew knew what they were doing. Okay, so let's go back now that we know that maybe um, maybe the ownership of the marina showed up that morning and the boat's gone and they kind of maybe put two and two together. Okay. These boys are talking about the marina, this boat's missing and they just kind of maybe jumped to a conclusion and we'll get into that later. Going back to this boat, why don't you explain this boat again? What kind of boat is it? How big is it? Um, you know, what kind of capabilities does it have? It's a, it's an imitation Boston whaler. 14 foot uh, Boston Whaler, 24 foot, uh, sorry, 24 horsepower outboard engine. Um, so 14 foot or four meters as we refer to it up here. Um, it's not that large, but uh, again, imitation uh, Boston Whaler. Boston Whalers are, are renowned for not being able to sink. Um, you know, they, they, the, the website of the, the company shows the cut, boats being cut in half. Uh, been uh, having been shot with shotguns and everything else, and they still stay afloat. And basically, what they are is they're fiberglass stuffed with, with styrofoam, mm -hmm. um, and they 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 just do not sink. Now, my understanding uh, from from uh, the reports uh, that the police collected was that this particular boat had a pinhole in it, so uh, it's possible that, that it could leak. But in addition to that, uh, it was in it was in rough shape. But according to uh, the the manager of the of the uh, the marina, um, that boat would would take a long time to become waterlogged through that pinhole and, and sink, um, and certainly not within within a couple of hours or twenty four or forty eight hours. It would take a long time to be able to sink that boat. Okay. So th that's what it was. It was an imitation. Uh, Boston Whaler, but still, you know, designed the same way. <clears throat> yeah, and we have to keep in mind that uh, this boat's missing. These uh, six young men are missing. And, uh, you know, I have a little bit 
of boating experience, coincidentally going up to the same area of Canada, Rice Lake, which is about two hours <clears throat> northeast of uh, the, the, the location we're talking about here. And six people on a 14-foot boat, pretty tight, pretty cramped. Yep. Very Especially, it's, uh, you know, we're talking about <clears throat> March, so they're, right. they're wearing uh, pretty heavy clothes, too. Yeah. Okay. Am I then to understand then that this boat, uh, you know, just had the keys in it? I mean, what, and we'll get into whether there's actually any proof these guys got in this boat or not, but did this boat just sit there in the water, like with the keys in it? Was there, was there not um, any fencing or, you know, the keys like in an office or something? They just kept the keys in it or or what? Well, there was no key required for it. It was an outboard motor. So oh, uh, what, okay. what there was is a what there was is a, was a kill a kill switch. Oh, okay. Um, so you have to put the kill switch in to be able to to start the motor. Mm -hmm. um, okay. There was no there was no security at at the marina in, in that way, mm -hmm. outside of a, a couple of cameras. Um, but uh, so they had access to the kill switch and they, I guess they just put it in the engine. It might've been still sitting in the engine for all I know. I, I, no one seems to know the answer to that question. All right, so, when you, so say didn't an outboard, key. Yeah, when you say an outboard motor, do you mean like one of those ones you just like kind of pull and start? That's correct. All right, instead of turning a key, you just go back there and just pull it just like you maybe start a motorcycle or something. Exactly, yeah. Okay, And it's a, it was 20, 25, 25 horsepower. Okay. Uh, the understanding was it was probably uh, uh, less than a third of a, of a tank of gas, so that's a that's a five gallon uh, uh, five gallon uh, uh, tank. Mm -hmm. um, so probably just over a, a gallon and a half or so of, okay. uh, of of gas in it. Combination by the mixture of gas and oil. Um, right. Okay. It's the way those two strokes work. Oh, two stroke engine. Very good. Yeah. Um, as far as we have to remember, this was night and we'll get into, uh, you know, so, some of the complexities of this disappearance in a bit, this kind of boat, does it have any sort of navigational aids for being out on a, you know, a big lake, like Lake Ontario at night? Does it have like a compass? Does it, of course, GPS 1995, maybe not. But, you know, what kind of capabilities would that kind of boat have on a lake at night? None. Not even running lights. Wow. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a service boat uh, meant okay. to be used in, within, within the bay and, and, and probably only during the daytime. daytime. So there was no, no compasses, uh, um, nothing, nothing along that line, no, no, no sonar, or radar or anything else like that. Okay, so just the uh, just the uh, something that floats with an engine. That's it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, as far as these searches, as uh, we're going to get into a couple things that were discovered later that may or may not be connected to this disappearance. But initially, um, you know, they're out on the water. The like you said, helicopters, boats, nothing found, including the boat. Boat, nothing, right. no nothing found at all. Uh, anything like that? No. No. No, no evidence found it on. No, no toques, no, no hats, uh, uh, no, no jackets, uh, nothing along that line. Okay. Um, no shoes, and certainly no boat. Okay. How long would you say that they put in a pretty good uh, effort uh, trying to? Was it a day, a week? How long did these efforts go before they just said, "You know what? I just, you know, we don't know what to tell you." It was between twenty-four and forty-eight hours. Not very but, long. Uh, not not very long. No, uh, it it was it was sort of the the RCAF uh, the R RCAF the Air Force were the first ones to pull out, um, mm -hmm. and I've through an access to information request I've received all of the logs of both aircraft, um, which was real real good because they didn't have to do that for me, mm -hmm. uh, but they they gave me the logs of of, of the aircraft uh, searches for both aircraft. Um, so they pulled out after about 24 hours, and part of that was the fact that they were air sea rescue, and they had other responsibilities. Uh, so yeah. um, if you can't find anything in the first 24 hours, uh, then move on. Right. The uh, Toronto Police uh, Marine Unit um, seemed to be the second one to pull out, and then the the final one was was the Durham Regional Police about within 48 hours of of uh, 
the official okay. s saying that they're gone. So, okay. Um, if I can ask how far, once again, being that you have the logs, how far did they go out into Lake Ontario um, to look how many, maybe miles or kilometers in which direction or how many hours? How far would you say they went up and down the shore and then out into the actual lake looking? How, how, how far along? They, they, they went a fair distance. Uh, according to the notes, uh, they covered approximately 4,000 square kilometers. Wow. Of, uh, on, of flight flying. Uh, uh, so from Toronto, probably up towards Niagara, that area, certainly from Toronto, uh, down as far as uh, Prince Edward County, um, which is across from, uh, from uh, Rochester, mm -hmm. that area. Um, and uh, I would say they probably went beyond the, the, the Canadian uh, American border. Wow. which is halfway across the, yeah. the lake there so yeah. but it was it was a large search area that that the rcaf covered okay do you know how, being that you brought it up do you know if any uh american united states law enforcement or searching ever was done on the on the new york side i guess that would be the new york side like wilson new york any were they even called were they asked to look for anything at the time right at the time of the disappearance in march 18th of 1995 News there was a there was one report in the uh, in the, the access to information requests that I received that indicated that that a, a local sheriff in, in on the New York side was asked to keep us keep an eye out for uh, mm -hmm. for anything to be found. Initially, what they were asking him for was um, were any of these boys in custody in the United States? Wow. That, that was the initial request that they made and then of course after that it was it was you know if anything comes up uh, let us know type of thing okay all right now, so of course having, having, having said that though there, there was there was that and this we were probably going to get to it a little bit later but mm -hmm. there's the gas can issue we're, we're going to get to um, that for sure yes that, that was found by the by the coast guard Okay, we'll get to that uh, just in a moment. We're just going to follow the outline just right. to make sure these things are as organized as possible. A lot of uh, information here. You've collected a, a lot of information. Just want to make sure it's dispensed in uh, in a the, the easiest way possible. But yes, we're going to be talking about the video and in these pants, this gas tank tank in a in a bit. Here's what I want to get. Here's where I want to go next, though. The the something though I just kind of maybe looked over originally, but just noted it uh today is that there might have been two different marinas uh re, you know maybe you need to explain that we have the one where this boat is missing what about this other marina i understand it's right next door how could this be uh, you know play a factor into this what do you have to say about that well my understanding is that uh the the the, uh, the service boat was was missing from from the um, East Shore Marina, the Swanza Marina, which was right next door to uh, to them, um, uh, which where it was where the uh, the tricycle was. Now the tricycle, my understanding is that the tricycle was 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 taken out by Jay and a bunch of others the night of the sixteenth of uh, of uh, March, the, so the night before. Huh. the party um when they brought it back they tied it up to its mooring but i guess they didn't do a very good job tying it up so that's probably when it went when when it disappeared um interestingly enough that that tricycle never showed up anywhere um there, there was potential that it was it was it was it was sighted on the on the american side but it was never recovered um, yeah, <laughs> that's a long Another, way to float uh, for something like that to float. to float. Yeah, went well, in a long ways to paddle. Yeah, right. Yeah, when, when you think of it, that's a long ways right. across. Yeah. Uh, when you say tricycle, um, is this one of those things like with those big plastic tires? Yes. That, that I see like tourists like using like in the Caribbean when they go on like or something like that, you know, just yeah. for something to rent. This is what we're talking about. One of those. Right. Right. Okay. All right. So. Maybe I need to ask this. So this was the night before. So the night that these guys go missing, the very night before that, some of them had gone 
pretty solid proof they had gone to this other marina and taking some joyride and then brought it back. Do we now know, was this a common thing for some of these guys or was this like a new fascination, new thrill for them? Do we, do we know anything about that? Um, no, I don't, I, I can't say that, that for sure. Um, we do know that, uh, that, that the boys, generally speaking, were well known to the police for, for certain activities. And in fact, Jay Boyle had been arrested the night before, uh, um, um, basically breaking into a, a food mart, uh, up in, up in that area. So, um, and that oh. that kind of plays into the attitude of the police in this whole thing too. Is that right? You know, eh, these guys these guys are bad bad news. So yep, very common, very common, Bruce. To this day, yeah. 2022 here in the United States, very common, very common. They're yep. always looking for ways to not uh, investigate disappearances. That is for sure. Yeah. All right, so we have these two different marinas. The night before this disappearance happened, they take this tricycle out, bring it back, maybe don't secure it, it goes missing. And then the next night they go missing and then a boat in a different marina right next door goes missing. Just wanna Correct. line that up. Um, maybe this is where we can move on to this and this might be where going to the website and people looking at it while they're listening to this part might ha help. And this has to do with Lake Ontario, because this is really what we're talking about. If they did get in this boat and they went somewhere, it most likely was onto Lake Ontario. That's the only place to go. What can you tell about, um, the listeners and viewers about the water flow, the currents, and maybe the conditions of this night when, when they went missing? What do you know about all of that, Bruce? Um, Lake Ontario is a, um, it, it's a, it's long, a long lake. Um, if, you, if you take a look at the map, you'll, you'll see it's, it's quite a quite a lengthy thing. Mm -hmm. um, its source is is the Niagara River, so Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. The source from that is, is Lake Erie. So um, you got the Great Lakes coming out, uh, uh, ending up in, in Lake Ontario, and then Lake Ontario itself empties into the St. Lawrence River out, out to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, sorry, the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. Boy, that was a that was a mistake. Eh? <laughs> That's right, Atlantic Ocean. That's, we uh, got you, Bruce. That's right. Yeah. We got you. So, so that's that's the way. So that what happens is the current uh, tends to to run uh, towards Lake Ontario, but it tends to run that way um, along the American side. Uh, it tends to make a turn and come back along the Canadian side, down towards the Toronto side. And then back out again. So it's, it's circular, but it all, all escapes out to uh, to uh, to to the uh, St. Lawrence uh, Seaway. St. Lawrence, Lawrence Seaway. So it's really going. Yeah. The water is generally going in like a northeast direction, but within the lake, there's a lot of that water that also does a lot of circling too. Like in a yeah, and part of that is condition. a lot, and a lot of that has to do with the the, the depth and everything else. Right. It, it's quite it's quite a deep lake, uh, quite a cold lake. Yeah. I can tell you that from when I was a kid, goes going swimming in, in Lake Ontario, and mm -hmm. it was it was cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not, didn't matter what time of year. Yeah. Um, the conditions that night um, were, my understanding was they were they were they were fairly flat. Uh, there wasn't very much wind at that point in time, so it was flat water, um, and uh, and and very little wind. On, on the night that they went disappearing. Now, that changed within a 24 hour period and it started getting a little more choppy. Um, so, and, and the wind picked up and everything else so, over that time. So when you see some of the video um, from the news video of the, of the, the, Air, the, the Air Force, for example, out, out uh, doing, doing the lake, you see that the lake looks a little choppy. Well, it was. But it wasn't choppy the night that the, the kids went missing. Okay. Now, one more question about this. And we are not saying, because I think that there is still maybe some reason to believe maybe these guys didn't end up on the lake at all. And we'll get into that. We are going to do a little theorizing before this uh, interview is over. The listeners know that when I have somebody on, such as Bruce, who is an investigator, not a member of the family, we do tend to do a little more uh, theorizing than I would ever do with a family member. But given the conditions that night, 
if any of these young men went into the water, given that temperature, how long could they survive in the water before hypothermia, et cetera, would take over? Uh, it's debatable. Um, the, the, generally speaking, I would say anywhere between one and three minutes before they would, they would lose cognitive capability or, or <sighs> mo motion, you know, mm -hmm. they basically get cold and they, they lose uh, control. Um, if they, if they went under at that point in time, you know, okay. they toast. So right. I, I'd say between one and say one and five minutes at the most, wow. five minutes at the most. Not long. So maybe for the listeners, if they want to draw an example like the Titanic, we don't know how many people died on the Titanic, and a lot of those people died. They went into the water. They were living, but went into the water. But being that they were in the North Atlantic, the cold water, and everybody saw the movie uh, Titanic, and not to ruin it for everybody, but we know how Jack, and that's how Jack died at the end. But yeah. um, not to ruin it once again for anybody. So that's what <laughs> I, that's why I wanted to ask that in case. Let's say they did go out, have boat problem, they go into the water. It would not be very possible for them to like swim to shore or something unless they were very, very close. Right. Okay. I'd, I'd agree with that. All right. Very and, good. Uh, and also, you know, you, depending on what they're wearing at the time, too, if they're yeah. wearing heavy clothes, sure. that can drag them down. So, sure. Very good. That's a good point. Okay. Now, you mentioned this earlier, and now we get to talk about it. And you do have this video up on your website, or do you have it on? Maybe you have a YouTube channel where this video plays. Um, where is this video that pe people can watch it at this point? Um, Bruce, well, they, they, can, talking. they can access it from the uh, from the website. Um, an awful lot of the stuff. If you, if you just take a look at, uh, for example, on the synopsis page, um, there's a there's an inset uh, set of pictures. Of okay. the three boys that were, that were found on, on the videotape. Okay. Um, the uh, the the tape itself is 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 well 1995. Quality. Uh, yes. Night nighttime, hot, low low quality and everything else. Um, okay. We can probably get into to more discussion on that because there's an awful lot on that tape that is, even the families didn't know about. Right. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the video right now. I just wanted to make sure that people have an opportunity to maybe look at something as they're listening or even watching this part of the interview. Um, let's being that you've brought up the video, let's, you know, I want to talk about it right now. Please explain uh, what the video shows and specifically you've looked at it. What, what is shown on it regarding, we'll get into some of the other things that are on it, but right now, who is shown on that video at the, the East shore Marina? What let's talk about that first. Yeah. Um, the the um just go back here so the the um the police got got this video okay and took a look at it and everything else and then they called all the families together and when they called the families together they showed them the video and they said do, do you recognize any of these kids so they showed them the clip that 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 you'll see on the website was shown to to them. Now I've taken screen grabs off that clip, just mm -hmm. just to to show. But okay. it uh, turned out that the the families recognized uh, Michael Cummings, uh, Jamie Lafave, and, and Robbie Rumbled. So okay. they they were recognized uh, by what they were wearing, um, by the types of hats they had on, and everything else, mm -hmm. uh, by the families. So those okay. are the three that uh, that that were seen at the East East Shore Marina. When you take a look at the video, though, you'll see that there's two cameras, mm -hmm. or two images, I should say. The large image is was taken down uh, towards the docks. Um, I, I haven't got it up here, but I'll, I'll be putting it up fairly soon to show mm -hmm. show a map of of the marina right. as it was back in '95, uh, with where I believe the cameras were. So the, the large image of the of the video is actually the uh the area down by the by the docks mm -hmm. and that points towards the the, the east uh, in that area and that's where the boys were seen the smaller image um on the uh on the uh, on the pictures was taken 
a bit further north at of the marina, um, at the entrance to the marina. So this is this is where the the business office is. And if you take a look at that small image, you'll see there's a house at the very end, which tells us exactly where that where that camera was located. Okay. Because that house is still there. Okay. Wow. Why why that's important is because this gives us an opportunity to see uh, two different things going on. First of all, we see any any vehicles that enter the marina have to come around the corner by that house. Um, and we see the cars coming in or vehicles coming in along that area. Hmm. They then come to an end of a, of, of a long drive with boats on either side and everything else. And they, they take a, a, a right-hand turn and they come towards the, the large image or the, the, the camera yes. that's, that's, that's showing the large image. So we, we can see vehicles coming and leaving on, on the video mm -hmm. uh, that, that we have. And, and that's crucial in some, some cases. Sure it is. Some things, some things on that video that, that the police didn't even talk about. Okay. Um, uh, so the, the camera, the large camera, the, the large image camera is actually a motion camera. Um, so it's swinging back and forth. Now, I was told it was, it was motion sensitive, uh, mm -hmm. uh, motion uh, detecting. Yeah. Um, a little hard to believe back in 1995, they had good I technology for that. I but it does, it does, it does tend to stop and start and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, th that's basically what you're seeing on, on the videos. Okay. Okay. Very good. So, and so what we're saying is, and we'll get into only three guys, but so there are other people who are seen on this video. What are some of the other things that you see on this video besides who we believe these young men are? There was a car and like a guy and a woman get out of it. What are some of the other activities that are going on in this video that you've watched? Um, it it, st it starts early on. There's a, there's at uh, but now the the boys uh, were were seen at around one forty eight in the morning. Okay. Um, at uh, at uh, quarter after midnight, uh, a car drives up. Uh, so this is uh, you know twelve fifteen. Okay. Now on on the eighteenth. Yes. Um, they get out of the vehicle and the, one of them throws a very large bag over his shoulder and they go down towards the docks. Okay. Um, don't ever see that vehicle, by the way, leave, um, but it, it does leave. Um, so that's one of the vagaries of the, of the way the cameras are set up. That right. We saw it come in. We saw them walk, walk around with the bag and everything else. Mm -hmm. Who those people were, the police didn't, didn't bother uh, following up on that. Hmm. At uh, at twenty seven minutes after after midnight, um, two other persons arrive on foot. One coming from either side, toward towards the middle. Um, they they were independent of each other, um, but again, police didn't bother following up on that. the 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 most important piece of, of information, though, or important piece of video, was was. Um, taken at, uh, let me just make sure I got the time right here. Um, I believe it was 2.01. Now the boys had gone past the camera at, 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 uh, at 1.48 in the morning. Right, okay. Somewhere around 2 to 2.30, there was, there was a report that somebody in, in the marina or at the marina heard a boat going out on the lake at two o'clock in the morning. Okay. At around 2.01, there, there, on the large camera, we can see uh, three people come in on, onto the to the to marina area in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked my uh, my my eight year old granddaughter if she'd look at this thing and tell me what she sees. <laughs> and and she said at the time, "There's a there's a boy and two girls." And okay. that's what I was kind of hoping that she would say, even though I didn't, I didn't ask mm -hmm. her to say that, because the the video shows that at around two oh one or so, there are these uh, two girls and a and and a boy, um, standing in front of the the camera in the distance. Interestingly enough, one of them's got his hand up like this. Now, and he's pointing the, towards, uh, doing something. Yeah. Pointing towards pointing towards the girls who are standing a bit further over, mm -hmm. um, 
but again, the police did not even bother following up on that to find out. I mean, they were there when the boys were there, apparently. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they would have heard something. Um, who, were, who were the people? Who, was, who were the girls? Right. Who, who, was, who was the boy? Um, again, police did nothing to follow up on that. Okay. A lost opportunity to, right. to find out what's going on. Okay. So, the, the video, the videos, it's filled with, with little things like that. Yeah. Um, and Frey, I should warn anybody who's going to watch it, whether on your website, look at the screenshots and, and, and on YouTube, that the, uh, it's 1995 quality. In fact, given that I was 25 years old in 1995, I wouldn't even say it's 1995 quality. I would say it's more like 1985 quality. So I just want to, you know, I just want to prepare everybody before they, they get some idea that it's yeah. like in 4K or something. Um, yeah. But here's uh, an important, important question. Does the video show these boys, these young men getting on the boat? No. Does not. No, there's no, there's no, there's nothing on the video indicating that uh, the boat would have been behind the camera. Okay. Um, so there's no way that it could have been seen. Um, there was a report that they, they'd stolen beer out of, out of, out of boats. Um, again, no evidence of that. Um, okay. um, one of the reports, by the way, doesn't even indicate there was evidence of, 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 of beer being stolen from anybody's boat. Okay. So, so, but so no, the outside of the, the three boys walking past the camera mm -hmm. in sequence, um, that's all that was seen on, on the cameras. All right. And you just said there's something very, very important that I want to ask you about right now. To be clear, not all six missing young men are seen on the video. Only three of them are. And in fact, of those three, they're not even what I, in my opinion, in watching the video, they aren't even like together. They're not walking as a threesome. It's like one seemingly after the other spaced by maybe several feet or several seconds. Is that your impression? And who are the three young men that are, that are seen on the video? Which three are seen? And what is your impression of seeing them on the video? Well, the, the three are, are Michael, Jamie, and Robbie. Um, so, uh, and I get the same thing. They I mean they were in single file, huh. walking past, and then and when you see the video um, in 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 you know in its full motion, yeah, um, they they're basically walking um, mostly with their heads down. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in kind of lockstep, but separated by by maybe a good meter or so. Interesting. Okay, so, so they're walking like single file, uh, unlike I think how people walk when they're walking in a group, you right? Know, especially with three people, whether it's now, men or we, women. Now, having said that, we we don't know because we don't see it on the video mm -hmm. what whether or not they were walking on something maybe there was a walkway that went across yeah. there that was maybe narrow or anything else okay. can't say for sure because we, we we don't see it on the video yeah okay good point very good point it is a walkway it's a marina walkways or gang planks or something like that are very common single file sure but it's important uh once again that three of the the danny is not seen on the video is jay seen on the video no chad seen on the video no so and one of those guys was the one who said he was going to the marina. Um, Jay. Jay, was Jay the one said he was going to the marina, marina, but he's not seen on the video. Correct. Okay. Your understanding and of the marina, maybe you have you went down there maybe before they started to change things. Would it have been possible for these three other young men to get out to that boat by some other means to miss the video or not? Your opinion. Um. I think yes, it's 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 okay. possible they could. Um, okay. The the street that runs uh, uh, parallel to the marina is, is Liverpool Street, um, mm -hmm. and uh, when we see the the, uh, the the on the video the the small inset, uh, you'll see see the a building on one side and 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 a couple of boats of uh, cars on the other side. So and and those cars are actually sitting next to, to Liverpool Street. So okay. it's, it's possible that, that instead of coming into the marina the way normally it would, they could have gone down Liverpool and then back in that way. 
Um, but uh, but who's to say for sure? Right. How, how they we just don't know. It's po it's possible though. There's I guess what I'm yeah. saying. There's more one more than one way in and out of this place. But then we have to start thinking. Why did three um, three of the guys go this way and like, or at least two or three of the other guys go some other direction? Doesn't, right. doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Okay, so, but just to be clear, only three of them are seen on the video. Of those three, none of them are the one who called to say he was going to the marina. And, and most importantly, there's no video that shows them ever getting on the boat itself, even though that we know the boat is missing. Correct. Okay, what do we know about any video? Did, was there any video... Uh, from this other location, this other marina, the Swan Marina that's right next door. No video, or did it get lost over the years? What do we know about that? Um, if if there was any video, I couldn't find it. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, okay. It certainly wasn't shown to the, to the families. Um, it took me three uh, access to information requests just to get this video. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I'd asked in, in my all three access requests for any and all video that was that was collected yeah. you know uh from from the area so uh when they came back they after refusing my first two uh, mm -hmm. for, for very strange reasons um when they finally finally gave me the and, and the third one um there was only this this one particular uh, uh video so okay. uh, i have to i have to assume that there, there was no other video that uh that was that was there when when so, you got the video uh how much of the video did you get like how many hours of video when you did get it how much how many hours did they give you um about six about six hours worth wow um it uh, it came in uh, it had been edited um hmm. so the the full six hour video was actually sped up um so right. that they, they could go through it um the the actual raw video uh, was not given to me. Oh, okay. What was given to me was was the edited, um, and and I pulled from that the, the information I was I was looking for. Okay. So there was there was three sets of, of of video. One of them was the overall six hours sped up. Mm -hmm. Then there was a, there was a smaller segment um, of about three hours um, that was uh, including the the time that the boys. Went went past the video, and I believe, if I'm mistaken, the the third one was like a compilation thereof of of everything. Okay. So. Uh, what from what time to what time did they give you? Uh, how much before they're seen on video to how much time after they're seen on that video? Oh well, the the overall one uh, starts at nine o'clock in the morning, um, uh, on the seventeenth. Oh. Oh, and okay. ends at about uh, you know what I say six hours, but it's actually longer than that, isn't it? It's it's almost it's almost uh, I'd say it's, it's closer to twenty four hours with with the video. Okay, but it's that, edited that, down. Yeah, it's sped it's sped up and edited down. So they gave you a video that starts well before uh, these guys show up at the marina, and it ends well after they them showing up at the marina. That's correct. Okay. Um, all right. That's it. That's interesting. All right. So you maybe even see daylight, the sun coming up on that video, maybe at the end, maybe sun going down and sun coming up. Sun going down, sun going. Down. Okay. And as you stated that one car, you never do see it leave, even though you have video of it. Yeah. I, I, for the life of me, I've gone back and through that a couple of dozen times. I would think that um, the car as it's leaving would Mm -hmm. take would should be able to be seen, seen on the on, on the the small inset uh, video but i didn't even see it there okay so no uh, there, there may have been another way to get in and out um right i i don't know for sure um okay okay it's just it's weird to me i have to say being that they have this video there's not there wasn't a camera actually pointed at the marina itself that you would have think that they would care about having a marina uh camera pointed at the at where the boats actually are in case one got stolen or something that seems uh kind of um not suspicious but uh unexplainable to me yeah but okay no, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with it yeah okay um maybe just overall besides what we've already talked about we have this car with these two people getting out of it you have these this boy and two girls we have these two people 
Uh, anything that you would say that uh, is suspicious on it? For example, maybe somebody running away or maybe somebody trying to avoid being seen on camera, anything like that that, that comes to mind in watching the video? Uh, no, I can't say I, I, I've seen any of that at all. Okay. All so. right. All right, so to sum this up, going back to the night before, we have this water tricycle that these guys said, at least a few of them said they they uh, took for a joy ride and, and brought it back. Maybe they didn't secure it strong enough and it kind of floated away maybe. That was at a different marina, but it's right next door. And then this night we see three of these guys, only three, going in. They go missing along with these other three. And then the boat at that particular marina is also missing, but it's not seen. Uh, there's no evidence that these three guys ever got in the boat or anybody ever got in the boat. Okay. Correct. Let's uh, move I, on. Except, for, except for one thing. Please. Um, there, Go ahead. there was a report that uh, uh, that some of the local people heard an engine mm -hmm. uh, on the lake at around 2, 2 right. 30 in the morning. Uh, now, who, whose engine? Don't know. Don't know. It could have been that those people who pulled up in that car, for all we know. Right, they could exactly. have dilly dallied around and doing stuff, and then they finally started their boat up and left. It could have been them. Sure. Okay. And so we're now going to uh, talk about this gas tank and a picture of it, along with what we're going to be talking about is the Lost Boys of Pickering.com. It's on your website. So why don't we talk about that now? Okay. On the 29th of uh, of March. So this is uh, um, eleven days or so after after the disappearance. Um, someone was uh, going along the shore of Lake Ontario on the American side and near a place called uh, uh, Wilson, New York. Um, and they had spotted a, a gas can. Um, two reports on that. One said it was floating in, in the water. The other one said it was on shore. So we're not really sure which is which. Uh, that person contacted the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard uh, recovered the gas tank um, and in turn called the uh, called the, the Durham police. And the reason they did that is because the gas tank uh, was had bilingual writing on it. Um, so and bilingual, we have bilingual tank writing in Canada, whereas mm -hmm. you only have unilingual in, in, in the United States. So mm -hmm. they felt that perhaps this was connected in some ways to to something in Canada. So they contacted Durham police. Okay. Um, Durham then went over and recovered the tank, uh, brought it back, took it over to the East Shore Marina, uh, which is where the, the boat was stolen. Asked the, uh, the supervisor over there if he recognized the tank, and he said he couldn't be 100% sure, but he believes that, that that was the tank that was in the boat the night it, went, the night it disappeared. Huh. Three, three interesting things about the, uh, about the tank itself. Number one, the recognition or the identification of the tank, according to the, the notes, was based on a dent in in the in the tank. Now I have I have collected a lot of information about the, the, the tank. I've got probably 30 or 40 photographs that were taken of that of that tank itself from, from the police files. Um, the the uh, uh, dent that they're talking about is very, very small, very slight. And I'm really surprised that anybody even noticed it, hmm. um, because there's another another set of photographs too that that show where that tank was being kept, and it was it was part of a of a bunch of four tanks, and all, all of those tanks were in really really sad shape. I mean, they were scratched and dented and um, and peeled, uh, paint and everything else. And the fact that uh, this this one supervisor can say, oh yeah, that's the tank from our our our, our boat, a little suspect. But even more suspect from that, this is 11 days after the, uh, the, dis the disappearance. Uh, this tank is found floating upside down uh, with no cap on it. Um, two, two things involved in this. First of all, uh, 11 days after the disappearance, a tank with no cap on it floating upside down. At no point in time did it ever flip over or fill up with water or or anything else like that. I did. I, it's a little suspect to me that that it would stay that pristine uh, upside down for for eleven days. Mm -hmm. The second thing uh, that that was odd, and it was mentioned again in in the report, um, 
from one of the supervisors um, is that the the connection for the for the, the the gas hose to the tank is what they call a bayonet connection. So if you if you think of, of a bayonet the way they sort of push in and they click down. Yeah. Well, the same thing happens in, in this particular case. It, this is actually pushed in and then there's a little seal that, that connects it and keeps the, the hose in place. They call it a bayonet. Um, if the tank had been with the boat and the boat did sink, let's assume it did, um, that tank would not separate unless it was done specifically they separate the the bayonet from it you it, you can't pull it off okay so if if uh, if the tank had had been attached to the boat and the boat sank you would expect that the some, at some point in time uh, or at some point along the, the the length of the the hose uh, there would be a break someplace and there was right. but the, there was not not even a hose attached to this one so whatever whoever separated the, the the tank from the engine pulled pulled the bayonet out so mm. um now what's 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 the significance of this the significance is 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 merely that number one um who would have the the uh, presence of mind to run out of gas take take the tank open it up disconnect it from the from the boat and then throw it overboard mm -hmm. okay yeah. and if they did where were they when they did it because this tank ends up in, in wilson new york which is diametrically south of, of, of pickering on the american side yeah and the current even 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 the 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 people from the east shore marina said that that boat if it had been lost out in the lake, would it put, would have ended up somewhere around Rochester? Well, so, so would the tank. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. but for some odd reason, this tank ended up in in, in Wilson, New York. Um, we don't know why. Um, mm. Is it the tank from the boat? I don't know. Uh, maybe I should ask you this, and I know we've talked about this. How universal are these tanks? Uh, how unique uh, were the tanks on that boat? Is it like just about any boat? It's kind of like this Boston Whaler has has about the same kind of tank, or or what? It's it's a ubiquitous tank. Um, mm -hmm. uh, virtually every tank is is designed the same way. They all have the same colors by, by law. They had the same type of writing on the on the outside. I forget if this is an Evan Root or um, which, which tank. There's no Yamaha, mm -hmm. so it's the Yamaha tank in this case. But they all okay. basically look the same. The interesting thing is that, uh, as I said, this is a bilingual tank. Right. Um, there, there is a marina in, in Wilson, New York, which was also owned by the Swan Marina Company, which is the one from Canada. So. It's possible that this tank actually had its had its origin in in the United States before it was found. Uh, it may not even be a can, a can from Canada. It may have been a can that was transferred to to their American subsidiary over there. Who knows? In the end, so right. But, and uh, maybe the listeners need to understand this. When he says uh, bilingual, he's meaning English and French. Right. Uh, for us right. uh, stupid Americans. Um, so, and because I think maybe in 2022, at least here in the United States, when we start talking about bilingual, we think uh, English and Spanish, Spanish. even right. though Spanish is not an official language of the United States, but a lot of people still speak it. Um, so in Canada, by law, things have to have both English and French on it. And that's what you're talking about. This gas tank had English and French writing on it. Correct. Okay, very good. All right, so then this was found though uh, on the shore or slightly offshore from Wilson, New York, which is just about due south from Pickering. Correct. Okay, your opinion, if that, if it was in the boat and the boat sank just offshore of Pickering, would that tank have floated, somehow it gets disconnected, would it float to Wilson, New York or where more likely would it, should it have ended up? If it went into the water right outside of Pickering, I would say it end up. It would end up in Toronto, down so like a southwest 
of uh, almost, you know, southwest of the location, not directly south. Uh, yeah, actually more west than south, yeah. More than what, more west than south. Okay, thank right. you very much. All right, so we have this question. Maybe the gas tank from the boat, but it's hard to tell given that these tanks seemingly are all about the same. But it's at least something to think about. And seemingly somebody was aware enough to see it and maybe kind of put this all together. Well, though there was that disappearance and that boat that's missing, it could these those two things could be connected. Do you um do you happen to know, once again, being that you've been working on this for 12 years? Uh, we're going to get to the pants in a second, but any other kind type of what we might call boat equipment that was found that could be connected to this missing boat at all? Um, no, no, there was nothing, nothing else found. Now, there, there is in the files a number of sightings um, that didn't appear to be followed up on. Um, one of them, for example, was... Uh, a report from the Royal Canadian Air Force um, who said that uh, they had spotted a boat floating at the, at the surface hmm. on, on the lake itself. Now, at the surface means it was probably flooded, yeah. but because it was it was uh, non-sinkable, it would float just, just at the surface or just below the surface of the water. So it would be seen by, by an aircraft, but probably not seen by a boat because of the, the way that the yeah. light is. Sure. Now it doesn't appear that anyone followed up on on that. I cannot find any any uh, files in from from the police. They have not given me any. Um, the the RCAF uh, files indicate that this is what they saw, but uh, there was no follow up in, in, by them on also. Um, where what where was this sighting? Um, it was it was on the lake. Um, but I, uh, I don't recall exact location, but it was, it was on the lake and, and the files indicate where, where it was on the lake. Okay. It was, it was closer on the, it was on the Canadian side of the border anyway. Okay. It's a little surprising maybe that they didn't follow up on that. What do you, any insight into that being that, I mean, you'd think that's what they're looking for. You'd think they'd send a boat well, out there to check it out. What do you think? I, I, if it was me, I'd have sent a boat out right away. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that, that was a that was a concrete piece of of evidence that that's been lost. Now there there are other reports of um, fishermen and tour operators and everything else who uh, have uh, you know fish sounding uh, uh, sonar type of thing, yeah. um, who make reports uh, back back to the police of of anomalies that they're seeing on on the bottom of the lake. One of them was uh, it appeared to be a boat. Um, uh, standing up straight like this, huh? Um, so being held down by a motor, but but being held up yeah. straight like this. Yeah. Again, the 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 location was given, um, but there doesn't appear to be any follow up on that either. Um, there's a number of other um, interesting reports that none of them appear to be followed up on by by the police. Okay, I guess we just also have to remember, on the other hand, Lake Ontario. A uh, huge lake has been used by mariners going back many centuries. So I guess we wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of boats on the bottom. Right. right? In so fact, in, in, in Frenchman's Bay, uh, there, we've seen at least six or seven boats that are sunk in Frenchman's Bay. So right. alone. <laughs> right. For all sorts of reasons. I even think like here in the United States, I live in Florida. A lot of drug runners that are going between like Florida or in the Keys and like Cuba or, uh, you know, Dominican Republic or Haiti, you know, they'll ditch their boats, they'll sink their boats on purpose. And you can go down there, scuba dive, and there's these drug running boats that are just sitting right there on the bottom. That's a well-known thing down here. So maybe we need to be open to something like that as well. Okay, let's, uh, maybe I should add on that point, maybe I should ask you this being that we're talking about this gas tank before we move on. And you said it was like about a, if it is the gas tank, that was in this Boston whaler, that was in this marina, but it was only one third full. Your opinion, could somebody get in a boat uh, with six guys or at least five guys in it or three guys and make it the whole way from that marina to Wilson, New York on that amount of gas? Your opinion, no. what do you think? No. No, the estimate was uh, 25 miles at the most. Okay. Um, so 
and, and again, a maximum of 25 miles. So no, they couldn't have made it all the way across. Now, that's not to say that uh, that whoever stole the boat didn't didn't steal gasoline or yeah, or oil from, from from somebody else. Uh, sure. Uh, or or for that matter, that 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 we we know that there was only a bit over a gallon worth worth of oil, uh, gas and oil in it. It might have been more than that for, for all we know. So. Okay, but if it. But I guess what we're also saying is if the if that boat had a full tank in it, it would be easy, very easy for somebody to take it the whole way across the lake. A oh, shot. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not a problem. OK. All right. Let's move on to this. Now, something else that was eventually found, but not like right after the disappearance occurred. Let's talk about these red jeans. Once again, this is something that is on your website, lostboysofpickering.com. Uh, let's talk about the red jeans. Uh, what do you want to say about that, Bruce? Uh, 1998. So we're talking three years after the, the disappearance. Um, there was uh, two uh, sets of unidentified remains found floating at uh, the Brock uh, uh, hydroelectric uh, generating site uh, on the Niagara River. Um, Niagara River, as you know, that we've already talked about, is yeah. comes from from uh, going towards Lake Ontario, so it's, okay. it's upstream from from Lake Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, the the two sets of unidentified remains were found in the a catchment area, um, and no one knows how long they've been been floating there. But uh, but uh, one of the uh, one of the the sets of unidentified remains. Um, were was a single bone encased in a pair of red uh, jeans. Um, it was apparently a, a and again, the, the, neither the police nor the coroner have given me access to this information and the materials, so I don't know exactly what 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 was there. But mm -hmm. there was apparently a sock, um, the bone, the pants, a belt. And a um, uh, a black uh, uh, wallet with nothing in it. Okay, this, so this is recovered from one of the sets of unidentified remains. Okay. The, the the estimate from the anthropologists at that point in time in 1998 was that um, it was from a, around a 20 year old male, um, and. Uh, uh, they don't know how long they've been in the water. The interesting part was the, the description that, that the Niagara Regional Police made um, in, in a, an extremely, extremely heavily redacted <laughs> set of notes that I received from, from the police, considering this is unidentified remains. Yeah. They, they told me initially when I, when I made the access request that I was, it was being withheld because it was personal information to which I turned around and said, Who, who's, whose privacy are you protecting here? You don't yeah. even know who the person is. Yeah. So anyway, uh, bottom line was, it was described as a set of red Levi jeans, no, sorry, red denim jeans from Levi Strauss was the way it was described. Now, back in 1998 or so, there Levi did have a a special set of uh, jeans made. Uh, I don't know why, but um, but they were they were different from their their normal jeans. And number one, the colors, because they were red and they were green. Um, they had seven belt loops instead of five, and the little tag on the back of the one of the pockets. But they all have they all have this sort of bird like uh, stitching on the on the pockets, and on the uh, the right hand pocket at the back there's always a, there's a little uh, levi a, a symbol on it just sort of stitched in place in the case of these these special jeans um that little tag is actually orange and not not the normal red color that you would see on a levi jean okay um so what they were describing was a set, a set of Levi jeans from the night in from 1998. Um, and it took us, I found out about these things in 2014. At no point in time from 1998 to 2014 had, had they even bothered to 
connecting in any way these these identified identified remains hmm. to to the to missing boys. And the reason they didn't do that is because if the boys had drowned in Lake Ontario, there's no way they'd end up in in uh, in Niagara. Well, right. yeah, physically it's not possible right. that they would they would do that. But right. but where's the evidence that they they were lost in Lake Ontario? None, zero. Okay, so I guess, and we anyways, should clarify, Bruce. The reason it's impossible is because the current flows the opposite direction. If you put a pair of pants current. in Lake Ontario, they're not going to end up in the Niagara River. No, not even the close. Water flows the opposite direction. Very good. Yeah. Please continue. Thank you. So, so the uh, it took until 2014 when we finally uh, found out about these 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 unidentified remains. Um, I made access to information requests of, of the Niagara police and said, got a heavily redacted uh, set of set of notes. And in fact, so so much redacted that even the name of the investigating officer was was redacted from the from the notes, which just still blows me away to this day. Um, but most importantly, um, with the information in place, I started doing my investigation. I found out that that uh, the that the bones had been, or the the, art, the materials had been uh, found in 1998. They were sent to the hospital in the city of Hamilton for quote unquote autopsy, um, and then eventually they ended up back at at, at Niagara. Um, and by 2014, I found out about it, um, and then we we pushed. The police to do something about doing a DNA test um, because they'd never done a DNA analysis on the uh, on on the bones. Now in 1998, that wasn't that common to do right. to do DNA on unidentified remains. So Very new I, I don't have any I don't have any problem with that. But a little bit later on, and we're talking 2014, it was no longer a, a you know a, a dark science. Okay, <laughs> it was now is now fairly commonplace. Yeah. So. It took it took a couple of years and a a, a massive uh, uh, petition on behalf of the families to to uh, get the materials sent over to to the coroner to be taken a look at. And the reason we did this is because, as I said to you, the the, the pants that were identified in Niagara in 1998 were these red denim jeans from Levi Strauss. Yeah. Right. The pants that Jay Boyle, one of the lost boys, was wearing the night he disappeared, and we have photographic evidence of that because it was taken at the at his his apartment mm -hmm. before he left, uh, making a rather rude gesture with his finger. I see. Uh, <laughs> but uh, bottom line was he was wearing red Levi jeans, um, and this was back in 1995. Huh. Now. Sent got the materials finally over to the to the to the Ontario coroner, and the Ontario coroner took a look at it. And the Ontario coroner's in, interesting um, response to I, I finally got them to meet with me and, and also the family of Jay Boyle. Um, so we met one on one at at the coroner's office. And um, one of the things that I wanted from them because they, they said something during that meeting that that. Um, got stuck in me in my craw. I, I I wanted to understand this, so I went through the access to information request uh, system again, and I demanded their notes from that meeting. Okay, so I knew that there was a scribe there taking notes, so I asked for those notes, and they finally sent me those notes, pretty heavily redacted again, <laughs> mm -hmm. again. Okay. But most importantly, the the comment that was made was made by the the, the forensic uh, anthropologist who said it is not it is not possible that these are genes red sorry these are not it is not possible that these are Levi genes from the 1990s. That's what she said. And and the interesting thing is that they took another photograph of genes. And you could see, and, and it's on it's on the uh, it's not on this website, but it, it's on another it's on the Facebook page. Um, you can see it's seven loops, 
um, red jeans, Levi, orange tag, little loops uh, uh, stitching on, on the thing. They're, they're definitely Levi jeans from the 1990s. Huh. You know that because they were found in 1998. Right. <laughs> okay. So they're 1990s. So um, they end up, after telling us initially that they couldn't get enough DNA, enough sample to do DNA analysis, I told them that I would like to arrange to send those to a, to a forensic lab that I've worked with in the past to have them do it because they could do a micro sample. Uh, all of a sudden, they, they found enough DNA to do the testing here in Canada. And, and they turned around and they said, uh, uh, it is not... It is not Jay Boyle, and the reason is because we had Jay Boyle's, his mother had collected or, or retained a piece uh -huh. of his umbilical cord. And wow. that was, well, that's what we, we tested for, for Jay, and then we tested the, the bones, and they said it didn't match. Now, having said that, my investigation goes a little bit further than just listening to what people are saying to me. I'm, I'm okay. asking questions. The first question I asked was, why did it take so long to do the DNA analysis? Because uh, they had not done it by the time that I got the meeting with, with them, okay? And it was let slip by the anthropologist at that point in time that the reason they hadn't done the, the DNA testing yet is because the delay in getting the, the materials from the Niagara Regional Police, okay? And the reason that she gave the anthropologist gave for, for that delay was that they had they had done some work in their offices with their their evidence rooms and they had lost or misplaced the evidence box and they had to find it mm -hmm. so now now we have to ask ourselves the question okay we have a we have a report heavily redacted report from 1998 saying that these are red denim jeans from Levi Strauss, waist 30, 32, uh, mm -hmm. inseam 31, black belt and everything. It's, it's got all the information is there, right? Okay. We then go to the to the coroner's office in, in 2016, 2017, and the anthropologist said, this, it is not possible. These are Levi Strauss jeans from the 1990s. We have two completely different reports and it's somewhere in the middle of that, there was a delay in getting the the sample from from one to the other because they'd lost it. Mm -hmm. You know what? What are you supposed to do? What conclusion do you draw from that? I don't know. No. I don't, I, first of all, it's weird to me. How would an anthropologist to whether know whether they were Levi jeans or or whatever? I don't know how that person would be an expert on jeans being an anthropologist. Well, they they would. They probably have access to people who, who know the, the answers to these questions. Right. I, I, I'm only assuming that, that mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the thing. Um, but <laughs> it, it's interesting that she would say that. And, and I, yeah, went I, back, I agree with And you. I went back to ask her whether or not that was just misquoted because mm -hmm. what she showed um, and what's now on, the, on the, 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 the government of Canada, the RCIF, RCMP website on missing persons is is the picture from 2017, which shows these these Levi Joe's jeans. Strauss jeans. The, the old right. pictures from 1998 no longer exist on the on their website. I just happened to have copied them all all of them. Right, so. right. Okay. Some questions. You just mentioned the size of the jeans. These 32 ways, 31 length jeans. Is that the size uh, Jay wore? Is that yes. was his his height? Yeah. He was okay. He also had a he also had a black belt and a and a black wallet. Okay. And striped and striped socks. Okay. And also, how when you say these like were a limited edition, and I know you looked into this because we talked about this. How rare are those red jeans? How many were made that would be even around the Toronto, uh, Buffalo, Rochester area of the of the earth? I, I checked with the Levi Strauss company in, in Europe and in, in, there in Switzerland. And uh, I, I asked them specifically about those jeans and they said they were a limited uh, edition. They, they, they weren't sure um, mm -hmm. how many were made. 
Uh, they weren't sure of the distribution of them and everything else, but they were a very limited edition. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, uh, Jay's mother had bought both red and green jeans for him. And uh, to this day, she's still looking for those green jeans because she doesn't remember throwing them out. <laughs> All right, so the green jeans are uh, green jeans may be missing too, and the red jeans are of course missing. Now, I don't know how this factors into it, but uh, and this just occurs to me, being that uh, you're in Canada, of course, you use the metric system. Does that matter when it comes to jeans? Are not jeans in Canada sold in centimeters or whatever, not in inches? It sounds to me like those jeans that were they say they're 32 well that's 32 inches and 31 inches whereas don't aren't jeans in canada in centimeters or am i wrong about that no they're in inches believe it or not they are yeah yeah so, so levi strauss when it sends to this day when it sends jeans to the rest of the i guess the canada they just leave it in inches too really yeah yeah it's uh, huh. that's virtually that's virtually all all clothing by the way yeah um huh. even 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 neck sizes i have a mm -hmm. 17 inch neck okay so. see i'm learning something here today it just it was just occurring to me well maybe if they're in inches maybe that would mean they were sold in the united states that it was like come from the american side but now you're telling me we can't even go by that you know no. i don't even yeah. centimeters 2.54 times 32 it's about 80 or something like that 80 that would be 80 centimeters that's not how it was in it was just 32 inches okay so we can't even deduce it that way um so we find these genes and are you how secure are you in your belief that they did this dna test and got it right that it's not jay how, how secure do you feel about I'm, that I'm, conclusion i'm not uh, i'm not secure in that conclusion at all um huh. the uh I believe that they they probably got the the DNA right from the sample that they had. Mm -hmm. I just question whether or not they had they had the right sample. Okay. So you see, it's it, it when you go back and you know we talked a little bit about my my background and everything. Yeah. Else. Three three things for you that that we didn't talk about. Go ahead. I mentioned I mentioned to you my my medical background, mm -hmm. but one of, my, one of my very first jobs was was working in a morgue. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it was a forensic morgue at the time. So, so I learned an awful lot about, about, uh, forensics. Okay. At that point in time, I had to, because that was my job, um, part-time job, by the way, I was still okay. going to school at the time. So that's number one. And number two, I, I have, um, a certification in cold water diving. Okay. So I'm, I've, I've got ice certification, cold water certification. I also have rescue certification. So one of the things that I do know is I, I do know what happens to, to bodies when they're in cold water, okay? I also know um, how forensically bodies or body parts or materials have to be handled once they've been collected. Okay, so one thing that I knew is that there was no possibility, from my perspective anyway, that the, the bone that had been recovered, that the originally the anthropologist said or the, or the coroner said that they couldn't get the DNA um, testing done because they couldn't, couldn't find enough sample. I, I called it on that right away mm -hmm. because uh, my, my experience told me that it didn't matter if that bone had been in water for six months or 10 years, there are ways to be able to get information or materials out of the bone to be able to do DNA. And they finally did DNA. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, um, I know how, to, how you handle forensic materials. And here's where, here's where the, 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 their, the whole story falls apart from the police perspective. I received a, a letter as, as from, in response to a request that I made directly to the to the Niagara Police about the way that they handled the the uh, the materials that that they collected. Don't forget, there was two sets of evidence. Yeah, and, my, I, and I want to talk about those other remains here in yeah. a bit. But please continue. So, so, so I asked the question, and and I got a, a written response, lengthy one, and I appreciate getting it. But, but there were red flags 
all over the place. And as an investigator, the one thing you don't like is red flags um, because they're, they're the ones that, uh, that, that can cause you an awful lot of grief. The red flags in this particular case are this. The, the bones were collected or the bone and the pants and the sock and everything else were collected. They were sent to uh, Hamilton General Hospital for autopsy, okay? Um, according to the police in, in this, this letter that they sent me, um, the hospital had sent the materials to the coroner in 2014, okay? I knew from my experience in the hospital, number one, there's no way that the hospital would ever keep forensic materials around for, for 16 years, number one. Yeah. But number yeah, two, they would, they, would, they, would never have, they would never have the type of secure lockup that's required uh, for, for this. Right. So, so, so I fired back a, a request on, on, on the basis of this, and I asked for the, the, the continuity report. So I, want, I wanted to see who found this, who handed this to whom, and who handed that to whom, whom, and, and where did this stuff go, and the information, the documentation did not exist. Hmm. So, so there, there is immediate red flag to say that no one knows whether or not what was being found in 1998 was in fact the material sent in 2017 right. to the coroner. And because you can't connect the two, um, that tells me that it doesn't matter to me what you find at the coroner's end. I can't trust it because I don't know if, it, if there's any continuity between that material and the, what was found back in 1998. All right, of course. So. Very good point, very good point. Um, let's talk about those other sets of remains. Uh, these remains, this other set of remains, uh, can you describe them to the viewers and listeners? Were the, these remains were found at the same time in the same, like close to each other, or what can yeah. you say about that? Yeah, it was a collection area for on the on the river, so that's just like the intake area. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the water would the water would come down the river and it would be intake or sucked into the into the uh, to the, uh, the hydro hydro station there. So they they would normally get caught there and they'd swirl around and everything else and stay okay. there. Um, there's what they call trash racks on 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 most dams. These trash racks are are small screens that keep all of the, the, the crap out from, from going in. You see those in, uh, in, in uh, more remote areas, trash racks are designed to keep out things like pieces of wood and trees and everything else that, that make it sucked in from a lake yeah. in, into a water system. So uh, the, the trash racks and the, the buoys that are in the area and everything else would stop. They, so they would circulate around for years. And, then, and whoever, I'm going to use the word, whoever dumped those bodies there mm. knew that uh, they probably would not even be noticed or looked look for until they cleaned the trash racks and cleaned the area, which is once every five to seven years. Okay. I, I use the word dumped, not because I know something, right. but because it, it seems to me the, the most, most uh, ap apropos word at the time. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the the second set of remains were a bit more complete than the first than the than the, the younger one, but it was a, it was a, described as a sixty to sixty five year old male oh. um, with advanced arthritis, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So okay. he didn't fit the it did not fit the the profile of of uh, our missing missing boys, okay. unlike unlike Jay, right. Who, right. the, the other that? one who did. Gotcha. It, yes. Yeah. Um, have you taken any time uh, to look at any disappearances from the Canada area? I, I want to do that myself for the Buffalo, Wilson, New York area, maybe even maybe go into Pennsylvania, Erie area. Uh, any disappearances that you know of of 65 year old men who this could be? Have you tried to look track any like that anything like that down? Um, I, I did try try to look, but you have a system called NamUs yeah, in, we do. in the United States, and uh, NamUs is not available uh, or accessible yeah. by by Canadians. 
Um, so I'd have to get a, a court order to, to, okay. to get into NamUs to take a look. Right. Now there there was there was a set of remains found uh, face down in in uh, Wisconsin that I was contacted by by an investigator in Wisconsin hmm. because the and and they sent me a they sent me a um, um, a re uh, they drew the picture based on on the remains that they found. What do they call that? Uh, there's, there's a term for it. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, portrait Pinatula, or something. Right? Portrait. Yeah. Yeah. Reconstruction, yeah. facial reconstruction. reconstruction or something like that. Yes. Yeah. My mother used to do those things. Wow. Um, but anyway, yeah, they sent, they sent this photograph up and everything else and uh, it had long hair. And it appeared it appeared to be uh, Jamie Lefebvre. Now, they finally ended up doing the uh, doing DNA and found out it, it uh, wasn't. It was somebody else. Let's put mm. that way. Um, okay. So there, there, there's that. Um, I received a uh, a message from a lady uh, in uh, West Virginia uh, one time. Yeah. Um, who told me that uh, she had bumped into a guy coming out of a of a, a Walmart, um, a young fellow. No, young fellow probably be in the range of about 35 to 40 years old young for me <laughs> okay me too. Um, and you too yeah. but uh anyways uh she he was wearing a, a cut off t-shirt and uh the reason that she that she remembered this this little incident was because he had a tattoo on his shoulder and the tattoo was a rather uh, poorly tattooed uh, word called named Cujo, C-U-J-O, which was that. Uh, the dog, uh, the movie. The, the dog, yeah, yes. the dog movie. Um, turns out that uh, Danny Higgins had an identical um, tattoo of oh. Cujo on his, on his shoulder. Um, whether or not that's connected, don't know. Uh, certainly I, I contacted the police down that way to say, you know, do you have any files on anybody who was who say have been arrested or detained that, that had this particular thing and they didn't get back to me? So, okay. but uh, there's there's all sorts of strange little things like that that, that keep popping up. Well, let's uh, spin me being that you brought that up and we're getting toward the end of this interview and uh, now, but uh, we know we do a little. As the listeners and viewers know, we sometimes do a little more theorizing with bloggers and independent investigators or private investigators than I would ever do with a family. But there is this story about them maybe wanting to go to a club in the Toronto area. And is it possible, being that they didn't have a ride, that they could have used a boat to go down there? When did this story pop up? How did you find out about it? What have you done to try to figure out if this thing holds, forgive the pun, holds water or not? It, it came up in a conversation I was having with, uh, with uh, uh, a friend of, of uh, Jay Boyle. Um, uh, she's, a, she's a friend of their family, actually. Mm -hmm. And she'd, she'd mentioned that, uh, um, that um, there was this club in Scarborough, Ontario. Now, uh, Jamie Lefebvre came from Scarborough. Right. right. Okay. So there was a club and it was close to the water, um, uh, a beach area in, in Scarborough. And uh, there was there was a discussion that that went on that that uh, Jay said he wanted to go to, to that particular place. Mm -hmm. um, the boat, by the way, even with the, the limited amount of distance that it could go, could have very easily have gone to Jesus. to Scarborough. Sure. Um, so, but but I wasn't able to follow up. The the, the location is no longer there. Mm -hmm. uh, no one seemed to be able to corroborate the uh, the uh, the story and everything else. So I had to sort of let it let it go for for then. Okay. Being that you also uh, just within the last maybe 15 minutes talked about your background being a cold water driver. What is your understanding regarding, once again, we're just doing a little theorizing here. If they did have, so they all went on this boat and it capsizes and we know the water's very cold and they can't survive it. No human could, but what um, should we think about drowning? Does the, do the bodies 
drop and then they come back up. Of course, me being familiar like with the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, you know, many times they've brought up, you know, the 20 some men who were on that boat. None of their bodies ever have come to the surface and has something to do with the water or the temperature of the water. What can you say about Lake Ontario and bodies that go into the water? Would they come back to the surface automatically or would they stay on the bottom? What do you know? Um, would be a combination of both. Um, if if they went down, they they could they could stay down. Okay, and they they could get caught on the on the bottom. Um, the the pressure could could keep them down and everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, the cold the cold would help the the, the preservation that, that way. So there wouldn't be the the de, de uh, composition right that would that would produce the gases right. Now, having said that. In, in my experience, um, I can tell you that that it wouldn't happen that way for six youths okay. at the same time. Okay. I could I could see one, two, maybe three going down and never coming back up, but I cannot see six. You know, the you mentioned the Titanic and and mm -hmm. and, and Jack going down. Yes. That doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way. Um, he he froze, you know, the, uh, the frozen body at that time basically started to decompose, and it wouldn't just sink like this. It that this wouldn't happen. Um, you're familiar with the dead man float? They teach that to you. In, yes, the, yes, in, I in, am. In, in swimming, do, but ba ba do, yeah. Bas yeah. basically, basically, dead man float is you you drape yourself over the, over the water, and you'll stay and you'll stay afloat. For, mm -hmm. for uh, quite a period of time um yeah so so that that a body can go down and stay down uh yes mm -hmm. it can happen okay. the chances of six of them doing it at the same time i would say very very remote okay Regarding uh, being that you've been working on this 12 years, maybe you have you had a chance to look at other maybe accidents that have happened on, you know, not necessarily disappearances, but boating accidents, people getting out there, they're drunk, or boats hitting into each other, maybe bo boats hitting a buoy out there, or something like that. Um, what can you say about that? How often is it that people are, you know, let's just say dying out on the lake? And what do, what do we know about statistics about how safe or unsafe Lake Ontario is? I I don't know for sure on, on that one. Um, there have been obviously accidents on, on the lake, um, but uh, I, I, how frequent they are, I don't know. Um, most often if someone dies on the lake, they die on close to shore right. and it has something to do with, 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 with the shore. Yes. Um, interestingly enough, one of the, uh, one of the cousins of one of the boys that uh, they went missing um, also died on the lake. Mm. Um, interestingly enough, uh, when they did the autopsy, um, and you, you might recognize the term I'm about to use, there was no water in his lungs. Huh. So, you know, now you have to ask yourself, how, how did he die on the lake? If you drown, you, you get water in the lungs. Right. Uh, you're, you're dead before you get in the water. Mm -hmm. Chances are, so yeah. so there are, there are things happening in that area. It's it's mm -hmm. um, the Durham Regional Police. The, the Durham area is a rough area of of Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, the Durham Regional Police is is renowned for it's one of the probably the the least professional police forces, especially in Ontario, but possibly even beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, their their reputation is not good. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say they're just not good people, uh, yeah. but uh, but their reputation leaves a lot to be desired. Okay. Uh, now, my impression, once again, doing a little theorizing, my my impression in talking to you, Bruce, is that you don't believe necessarily that this was some sort of boating accident. That, of course, it's very easy to believe. These guys, they're drunk, they're partying, they go out in this boat, it's overloaded, they get out there somehow it capsizes, they all drown in the boat and that they just haven't been found yet. But I have to tell you, you've given the impression to me kind of that given your experience, your knowledge, I'm never going to be an ex uh, expert in this disappearance. You surely are though. You think that there is a foul play angle to this. Do you want to talk about that right now? What can you pass along to the listeners and viewers? 
Well, I can only tell you what I surmise on the, on the thing. I don't, I don't I don't have any evidence for this mm -hmm. either. In the sure. same way as the police have no evidence for, for for what their their conclusions are. But yeah, I I believe I believe that uh, there's the the potential for a um, a drug angle on this mm -hmm. whole thing is quite large. It's mm -hmm. possible that uh, it's possible that the boys were in the wrong place at the wrong time. That uh, perhaps they met in the, with some foul play out on the on the the lake, um, but the foul play in, involved uh, something to do with the drugs, maybe uh, the drug uh, dealers or, or or drug mules. Uh, maybe they stole the wrong boat. Uh, we we don't know for sure what that was all about. The other thing is that there there's in in the reports there are a number of uh, um oh let me let me go back on that go ahead um with respect to the to the drug side of the business and i won't use any names here mm -hmm. but there was a teacher um at one of the local high schools where, the, where some of the boys went to school he was also a um, um a guidance counselor and one of the things we know is that when the kids drop out they have to go to the guidance counselor Okay, if nothing else, just to check off the box that, that they went to the guidance counselor. Well, this particular guidance counselor was very heavily involved in the drug trade in, in that area. Um, he was hired in 1990, 1988, I believe it was. Um, I found he, through, through a, a back door, a back channel, I found his, his uh, criminal record which stretched to 1998. Wow. And uh, he was involved with not only drugs, but also charged with assault, um, theft, a number of other different different things he was he was charged with. The interesting thing was we have a we have a thing in Canada here where you can get your you can get your records uh, hidden. Now uh, there's a term for it up here. I forget what it is. But basically what it is, you go to the court and the court says Yes, you seem to have turned a corner. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all the records that, that, uh, of your convictions and we're going to put them in a lockbox. And we're not going to open that lockbox until the next time that you're seen before the court for doing something wrong. The interesting thing is that is that because the records don't exist and are not not accessible, um, this guy could go and and apply to become a scoutmaster. I mean, he'll get accepted because he doesn't have a criminal record. Okay, it's not about not available. Um, but let's but let's get let's get to the point of the thing. Is that mm -hmm. is that in this particular case, this 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 teacher, who by the way is is his drug name was the teacher. Okay, um, he's the guidance counselor. He meets up with boys who are dropping out of school, and you know they're taking drugs and everything else. So, all of, a, all of a sudden, this drug connection just keeps getting bigger and bigger on the thing. He was finally uh, in, in, in defrocked as a, as, a, as a teacher in 1998 after he was convicted of, of, uh, of possession with the intent to sell. He was found in his, in his apartment or in his, his room uh, sitting on a bed that there was half a million dollars worth of co cocaine underneath the bed. There was a, there was a gun. There was money and everything else, and he claimed that uh, he didn't have, he had no idea where it came from. The bottom huh. line, the bottom line is that I wasn't able to to get his yeah. his criminal record from the police because mm -hmm. uh, it's it's in the locked box. But what I did find when I when I started doing the back channel stuff is I found the records of his his uh, losing his teaching license from the the uh, the College of Teachers in Toronto, they have a disciplinary committee and everything else, and they have these disciplinary reports that they make on anyone who's losing their license. And in his particular case, one of the things that I found was a whole list of, by year, of the convictions that he had over over time. So, yeah. um, when you connect that with with you know the, the the drug trade that was going on back and forth and everything else between the, between the United States and Canada. Um, you have to not pull a conclusion, but you have to come 
to, to the realization that there's a potential for a drug involvement here. And if it is a drug involvement, then, then there's some pretty unsavory characters involved. And misadventure uh, doesn't fit that particular uh, scenario at all. This teacher, is, uh, this teacher was at the school that these guys went to? Uh, two of them were. Okay. So two, two of the bunch. bunch. Um, okay. The other thing is that we're finding, finding in, um, in the reports that I've, I've got through access to information, you, you receive reports, by the way, and they're, they're you know, there's a week's, week's worth here type of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah. In tiny little, tiny little letters, and a lot of it are, a lot of them are, um, are, are done in, uh, in handwritten form. Um, but uh, one of the things that you find is that there are people who um, claim sightings of one or more of the boys. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them who know the, the, the boys rather well. Um, a neighbor of uh, Jamie Lefebvre um, waving at Jamie on, on the 18th um, in, in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. um, his mother coming home um, uh, later in the, in the day from Niagara and finding and, and testifying that there are reporting that she found things missing and, and disturbed in the house. And Jamie was the only one with access. Uh, Danny Higgins, um, the day he goes disappearing, um, takes off a, a chain that he has around his neck, which he, he never took off, gave it to his mother and asked her, asked her to hold it for him. You know, something that these things are uh, out of character, um, and they 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 make you believe, not make you believe, but you 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 come to the conclusion that there's more to the story than just six boys going out stealing a boat, falling falling overboard in, in the middle of the Lake Ontario and disappearing. Right. There's more to it than that. Right. And what's also hard to understand, as we talked about earlier in this uh, interview, is that. Danny and one of the guys actually got in a fight at this party. So then why would then Danny hook up with these other five guys and go out on a, in a boat with them? It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. That was my question to a number of different people and no answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I, I think that's, I think that's rather odd. Yeah, now we don't know the, we don't know the, the, uh, the, you know the connection to that the, the boys are making um you know it, it's possible that danny made up with, with jay or maybe yeah danny jay said no oh, well okay well what the hell come on come along with us yeah um so um who knows yeah who on knows? the other hand though if i get in a fight with somebody the last thing i'm going to do is get on a little boat with that person going out to lake ontario when the water's you know <laughs> 40 degrees or something like that. That sounds like a recipe for my death. You know, uh, this guy could but, be getting set up. So there's that. No, right? no, ask, no, ask yourself the other, the other half of that question though. If, if that was the case, then what happened to Danny? Yeah, I know. I, I got you. Totally got you. Yeah. It's, it's, it is a mystery. And that's why, that's why we're talking about this. And obviously if it was um, straightforward, it might've been solved already. Right. If they all went into the yeah. water somehow and the boat, you know, is there. And then what exactly happened? How, how do they all go missing? How does everything yeah. go missing? Yeah, that's it. Now, now the the um, you know, we, we talked about the, the website and the Facebook page. And yeah. Everything else. And one of the things that uh, that I'm trying to do through the through the website specifically is raise funding because we, we have a number of things that we need to do. Um, one of the things we need to do is we need to do side scan sonar. The interesting part is that, is that side scan sonar um, is, is, are you familiar with the, the I am. side scan? Sure, absolutely. Yes. At the time the boys went missing, I, I contacted, not I didn't, at the time, I was in contact with a, uh, an old friend of mine in Belleville, Ontario, who um, has a dive company. And uh, they they do side scan sonar. I called them up and I asked. Them, I said, "Are you aware of the uh, of any side scan files uh, of this area, Lake Ontario?" 
And he said, no, I'm not aware of any, but I'll tell you a story. And the story was that uh, in 1995, he was contacted by Durham Regional Police to provide side scan uh, um, uh, services uh, on these missing missing uh, boys thing. And before he had a chance to even, even begin uh, to, to send his material and everything else, Durham Regional Police called and, uh, and canceled his contract. So, uh, you know, even 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 the, the police decided it wasn't wasn't worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So so after twenty seven years, it's difficult to say what we're going to find out, find on the lake, but there might be something in in uh, in the uh, Frenchman's Bay that we can take a look at. And there and there are also reports. Uh, specific locations, like we talked about, that boat that's standing straight up, yeah, uh, up from the bottom. Um, there are specific reports of things, anomalies that were, were seen that would probably still be there. And uh, I, I believe we should probably get a side scan sonar search done. Number one of Frenchman's Bay, but number two of very sp specific selected areas in Lake Ontario that 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 have been identified. Um, obviously, that 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 costs money. Right. The second thing is we, we need to do a, a I need to launch a, a legal battle with the both the, the Durham Regional Police and also the Toronto uh, Marine Marine uh, Toronto Police um, to to get them to not only release unredacted information about this 27 year old case, but number two, I want uh, the um, I want the case referred to a more senior police force. To be to be uh, uh, taken a look at. I, I want them to to go through it and basically reinvestigate um, through the documentation, identify where the the holes are in the case. And one of the reasons for that is because the families deserve number one answers, but number two, they also deserve um, to know if the police screwed this up. Yeah. Okay. Um, the police don't want to don't want to admit that they screwed anything up, obviously. Uh, but uh, that that's going to require us to 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 basically go to a court case along that line. The same thing has got to happen with Niagara and the and the Ontario coroner over that the uh, the red pants. So so has the uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police been involved in this at all? No. None. The only thing that they they they've been involved with. Um, has been that they control the documentation for the missing persons uh, files for Canada. You know, having said that, though, it's rather interesting to note that this was a multi-jurisdictional thing. 25 miles from Pickering not only brought in Toronto, but also brings in other, other towns and cities along, along the, along the Lake, Lake Ontario shore. At some point in time, the Ontario Provincial Police, the, 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 the Ontario Police, should have been involved, but they didn't get involved. Okay. Mm. They, they would look after the multi jurisdictional side of it. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is that the, the 25 mile uh, uh, radius that, that, that was given for that, for that boat also included the American side, you know, over the border anyway. Yeah. But at no point in time was the RCMP or our intelligence services uh, called in to, to take a look at it. I, I don't know if the FBI was ever involved in it. They, they would have certainly been involved if it was a, you know, a drug thing going across the border. Yeah. Uh, or our, our, case, board, or be, our board, border patrol, maybe that too. Oh, border too. patrol, you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have border so, patrol. so none of that uh, information, I, I, I don't have any of that information at all, mm -hmm. um, but it'd be interesting to find out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's where we sit. Okay. Bruce, why don't you give up the name of your Facebook page and your website again? And we mentioned it at the beginning, but I said we'd mention them right here at the end. Why don't you do that again? So if yeah, people have not yet gone there, do it right now. Uh, they can go do that right now. Yep. Yeah. So if you if you go to Facebook and it's uh, facebook.com slash uh lost boys 95 is, okay. is the, the site uh you know if you, if you put lost boys of, of pickering in virtually any type of search engine you'll yeah. you'll, you'll come up with all sorts of stuff oh, yeah on it. for 
for sure. In addition to that, yes. of course, the, the, the new website is uh, lostboysofpickering.com. Okay. And that's that's the one we're building right now that uh, that will have an awful mm -hmm. lot of the information that we've been talking about the last right. couple of hours. Right. Well, there's uh, listeners and viewers are going to find pictures of the gas can. They're going to find pictures of the jeans. They're going to find, uh, I think you talk about or have a picture maybe of a current, the current of Lake Ontario on there. You have screenshots of the video uh, and pictures, of course, of the young men themselves uh, yeah. at, at that time well, in 1995. Well, what we're also going to do is I'm going to be taking um, I'm going to be taking snapshots of some of the the access to information request uh, materials. Yep. Uh, for for good. example, this one particular one uh, where we talk about uh, 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 this is a, an area bottom of the lake is relatively smooth, no trees, no rocks. The only thing on the bottom appears to be sticking straight up. So I think people you know people can see for themselves the types of reports. Yeah, great. That, that we've been getting. Obviously, I can't put them all up there because yeah. there's there's literally hundreds of pages, but uh, yes. and and a lot of them you can't read. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any final words before we complete this interview, Bruce? No, I I, I appreciate your time. Uh, I appreciate your interest in, in this particular case. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's uh, it's a testament to uh, to all of us. Uh, that uh, that our uh, dedication to 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 publicizing these types of stories is what the families require. You know, at some point in time, we have to we have to remember that there are families involved in in, in this this story. Yeah. It's not just a story of six boys going missing with a boat and everything else. There's families involved. You know, there's there's uh, there's one one particular uh, family where the mother has died. And she died not knowing what happened to her son. Yeah. Uh, we have we have other parents and brothers and sisters and cousins and everything else of, of other boys that that for 27 years they've had they have no idea what's what 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 the answers to to all the questions were from yeah. from all those years ago. And it's guys like 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 you um, who who help publicize this thing and and hopefully you know somebody especially in your Canadian audience, yeah. it's possible that somebody knows something. Yeah. You know, the, the, the two girls and the boy that are shown in the video standing in, in the marina, yeah. you know, that's, that's a night, you know, I, I remember where, where I was when John F. Kennedy was killed. You, know, you mm -hmm. probably wouldn't. I but, do not. Uh, <laughs> not born yet. But yes, I know. No. I remember September 11th. You know, of course, I yeah. remember exactly those things. Sure. So, sure. so those things stick out in your mind because, because so, mm -hmm. The, the fact that six boys went missing on the 18th and those two girls and the boy were in that marina on the night that they disappeared is something that sticks in their, in their memory. And hopefully, hopefully, possibly even just through this, uh, this, this interview, uh, they'll, they'll rec recognize themselves in those pictures and come forward. Hopefully. Yes. That's yeah. what we're always hoping for. Always looking to move. Uh, something, a case, disappearance, investigation, move it forward. That's what yep. we're trying to do. Yeah. There you go. Well, Bruce, I appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Take it easy. You're welcome. And that was my July 30th, 2022 interview with Bruce Ricketts, independent investigator for most of the boys' families. I thank him for appearing on both audio and video for this episode. I also need to thank the listener and Think Tank member Jill, who suggested that Unfound feature the disappearances of these young men. Bruce's website is excellent, and you should surely check it out. However, I also have done a map analysis video showing where the marina is, where the gas tank was found, and where the red jeans were found. I also show you how water flows on Lake Ontario and what the predominant water currents are. This should be helpful to all of you as you try to determine if any of the items found could be connected to the disappearances. You can watch the video on the Unfound podcast channel on YouTube or at theunfoundpodcast.com. 
I believe you can now see why I called this episode what I did. There is a lot of uh, stuff involved in the disappearances of these six boys that doesn't seem to make any sense. What are some of those issues? Only three of the boys are seen on the marina video. Despite some of the boys being seen at the marina and the boat disappearing, there's no proof the boys, one or three or four or all six, took the boat. Danny getting on a boat with Jay or Jay getting on a boat with Danny, that wouldn't happen, would it? I think what I'm saying is that it makes all the sense in the world that all six went out onto Lake Ontario in a boat that was too small. And the boys and the boat disappeared all at the same time in the same spot due to an accident or some sort of misadventure. Yep, all the sense in the world. Likewise, to imagine that three of the boys disappeared on Lake Ontario and three disappeared on land due to a drug deal or some numeric combination of both and one didn't have anything to do with the other and this was like the worst coincidence in Ontario history challenges our sensibilities and imaginations. Yet, not being able to even find one of these young men or the boat doesn't seem to make any sense either. If these disappearances remind you of a very old episode of Unfound, the disappearances of the Marco Island 3, I understand that. Dave Madot, Kent Monroe, and Omar Shearer went into the Gulf of Mexico with Jeff Wanditch to scuba dive. Coincidentally, all four were Canadian as well. Coincidentally, coincidentally, also in the mid-1990s. Only Jeff came back. Jeff had a story, and the Coast Guard fairly quickly went to the spot where the missing three guys should have been. They weren't there despite the current being well understood in the Gulf, and despite the water being warm enough that they could have survived for at least a few days in their wetsuits. But is it the same situation for these Pickering boys? Is there enough to start believing everything is not as it appears? I'll tell you one item that catches my attention. There hasn't been an incident like this on Lake Ontario before or since. Despite tons of drunk and high teenagers surely going out on that water in overloaded boats for over a century. That's enough of a red flag for me. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. Right now, while you are in your podcast platform, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, wherever, give Unfound a five-star review, a thumbs up, whatever that platform allows. I thank you for listening. I'm at Denzel, and you've just finished this episode of Unfound.